right, welcome back to the I'm There podcast, guys. I'm your host, Freyway, and I'm here with my co-host, Kenny. Ooh. And today, we are here to talk about one of the best shows I've ever seen. It's probably in my top 10 shows of all time, honestly, especially because I feel like I relate to it a lot. The Queen's Gambit on Netflix, it came out during the pandemic, I want to say, and or at least I saw it during the pandemic. And it's just a phenomenal show, especially if you are a nerd like we are and you're into competitive gaming or have ever been into competitive gaming. I feel like this speaks to you on a really deep level. Uh, So many things that I can relate to about Beth Harmon. She is a phenomenal protagonist. They make you like her pretty immediately, just the way she is. She's naturally an outcast kind of person. She's naturally a bit egotistical. Uh, I certainly can relate to that, especially if you knew the younger me. And more importantly than everything, she really has a strong desire to win and to do well. And when she doesn't, she is not fucking happy. And I know all about that. So, yeah, I just want to go into this because this show, although it came out a, a, a little while ago now, I randomly had this urge to rewatch it and I wanted to do a podcast episode on it and I want to do it. It's it's justice. Like I didn't want to kind of just freestyle without knowing exactly what happens and all that. I wanted to really go in on this show because i really i like it so so much so uh yeah kenny and i discussed like over a week ago yeah we would uh we would go into it i watched it i don't know probably not a year ago because it was after we started the podcast that i watched it but i watched it a couple months ago i don't know five months ago four did you basically finish it in one night uh i believe so there's only seven episodes, but it's, it seems long. Yeah, because it's only seven episodes. So I finished it in one night. It does. It's crazy how long it feels. It feels so much longer than it is. Like, I looked at, I, I looked over some of the synopsis of some of the episodes, and I was like, that happened in one episode? Like, Isn't all of that crazy? wasn't, like, Yo, there's a lot of shit that happens in one episode. I think the reason is because, well, here's how I like to think about it. A movie is usually two to three hours long, right? And when you have a Netflix show that you can binge watch all the episodes, if every episode is an hour and there's seven of them, that's seven hours. So it's really like you're watching over Mm -hmm. two movies worth of footage. And so it is a lot when you put it that way. Like when you think about the fact that it is seven and there's no commercials, there's no cuts or anything like that. This is every episode is a minimum of an hour long in this show. And there are seven of them. So seven hours movies again, like two hours. So you can get three movies in before you finish the Queen's Gambit. But I don't know something about this, even though it is technically kind of long it also when you get to the end of it's like damn a lot happens in this in this show like a lot happens a whole whole lot and that's the thing though is that it feels long in a good way yeah what i'm saying is that even though it's only seven episodes it feels longer than seven hours but and i feel like a lot of times Something like that is said as a negative thing, like, oh, it was so long. But Yeah, people do I don't complain know, it's... about things now, like the Batman movie that recently came out. I know a lot of people complained about the length, and that seems to be a complaint nowadays with movies being too long. Like, oh, it was good, but it could have been shorter, or it was bad, and it was too long, that type of thing. Yeah, but in this, I you know, it was really good. It's, a, it's impressive how many stages of life it feels like the character goes through uh, in individual episodes. One thing I want to, excuse me, touch on real quick that you mentioned earlier in terms of people relating to it is that, you know, as every, as a lot of us do, we talk about things with people if we like it and enjoy it. And this show has been compared to like, you know, being a genius and like feeling alone and things like that. But I do think it is important to point out that it's pretty relatable just in the aspect of like being into something that's other when everybody else isn't. So I think one of the best scenes in the show is when she goes to the party and everybody like, yeah. like she doesn't really fit in with all the girls and they're all talking about like boys and just like, I don't know, quote unquote, typical teenage school girl yeah. shit. Yep. And she's just like, oh, she, she just talk, cares about talking about chess or whatever. And I think a lot of people that are in the comic books or in the cartoons or whatever, you could, you run across that. Like I remember being in high school and it's like, I'm just really into playing Melee or playing Pokemon or, or watching fucking Bleach or whatever. Yeah. And, like, you go to a party to hang out with your friends from school, and you kind of realize, like, I've got nothing to talk about with these people. Like, they're yeah. so fucking boring. And, like, maybe they're not boring in their own circles, but, like, to me, they're so fucking boring. And I'm not a genius or, like, super – it's just, like, when you're really into, like, something that the rest of the world isn't into, it's it can be really alienating – hanging out with quote-unquote normal people. And trust me, I know, because growing up, I was teased a lot for playing Yu-Gi-Oh! And I never really cared, but I do know a lot of people would not play Yu-Gi-Oh! with me, even if they were Yu-Gi-Oh! players, because they were afraid of people walking up to them and teasing us and stuff like that. I never gave a fuck. 
I've had I have yeah. very thick skin because my parents are just very harsh people when I was growing up. So naturally, there's nothing that a person on the outside world could say to me that would like shake my feathers or make me feel embarrassed about what I'm doing. But some people, I know the feeling of just, you know, you know, you're different, right? Like, you know, most people at your school are not playing Yu-Gi-Oh! They're not watching Dragon Ball Z and in, in re- at recess where everybody else is probably playing like jailbreak or uh, some kind of football or something sports like you're fucking sitting there doing martial arts with your friend who's also a nerd and doing Kamehameha's <laughs> at each other that are not actually coming out and having a time on your yeah, life yeah. in your own little world where literally all the other guys are doing something sports related or whatever. Uh, so I know I know what that's like. And also, you know, being teased on your appearance because uh, you know like she goes through that phase as well and i think that that's something too like when you're a nerd you're probably more into wearing clothes that might have graphics of shows that you like if let's say for example i wanted to wear a sailor moon shirt right like that would be something that kids might tease you on being a 10 a year old boy and they're like what the fuck like why do you have that sailor moon shirt on it's like who gives a fuck you know what i mean like and beth gets that who from, from some yeah. of the girls but she doesn't really, she doesn't really care one thing i like about beth <laughs> despite the fact that like people try to make her feel weird or tease her about certain things. And she's that socially awkward kind of person. I love it. But she, at the end of the day is like, whatever, like you guys don't get me. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with being alone. She specifically says at one point to this reporter in the middle of the show, I think it was like episode three or four, but there's an interview that she gets. And the reporter asks her a question, trying to allude to the fact that Beth might be a little off or strange or crazy or that she may relate chess to other things that it, like making it bigger than what it actually is. Oh, my God. And she's kind of like, I like being alone. Like, I'm I'm perfectly fine with being alone. And that is that is me. Like, I am such a I hate people kind of person. At the, like, if I'm being completely honest, I'm a homebody and I just like being to myself and all of my glory, like even with people knowing me for Yu-Gi-Oh and like I'm a social butterfly when I'm around the scene but when I'm alone I really enjoy like I love being alone but what were you gonna say yeah that I was gonna say so another great yeah so the show's cool it has a lot of that stuff I think is relatable um to a lot of people because even just on the note that we were saying being nerds I do think pretty much everybody in life regardless of what you're into you you feel alienated at some point right so I do think it has a relatable feeling, but also that reporter scene was so fucking cringy because of how accurate it was in the way, in the way people view women in things like she's talking to this girl and she's like, did you see the king as a father figure and yeah. maybe the queen as a mother? That and I was just like, wild. dog, <laughs> like it. And it's just such a thing that like people, like people project on you and yes. like present to you and you're like. It's just a fuck. She's Orange like chair they're, psychology they're, they're is pieces. so dangerous. She's like right? they're just they're just chess pieces. She's yeah, like she's yeah, yeah, but you know the the king is a father because you're an orphan <laughs> and a woman and a woman oh, that didn't have a father God. and women, especially orphan women, need fathers. And it's Jesus like relax, God. bitch. <laughs> yeah, her mom cuts that shit short real quick. So I guess before we get all into the specifics of each episode, let's start from the beginning. So for people. If you're watching this, this is going to be a full discussion about the entire show and more so conceptual than just going over, like recapping it. But uh, The Queen's Gambit is amazing. So if you haven't watched it, I do highly recommend it. I know some people listen to episodes of this podcast without actually being interested in the subject that we're talking about. If you are a nerd, I implore you to watch this show. It is amazing. I just got one of my friends, Aubrey, to watch it. He watched it one night. He hadn't seen it. He actually plays chess. And he never saw it before for whatever reason. He, it was, he said it was on his long list of things to watch. And I have that same type of list. But he, I guess, started at episode one and just finished it in one night. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, if you start it, you probably won't finish it. Although I will say, I know how some people feel about episode one. This, this show doesn't start off the fastest. It's not, a, it's not a quick show in the beginning. It takes a bit of setup, like most shows do. Like, think about Game the of Thrones and stuff. Chess. It's a show about chess. And the good thing is, for people wondering, you do not have to know how to play chess literally at all. I've never played a game of chess in my life and I could not tell you the first thing about chess. I actually know more about 4D chess that I saw in Code Geass than I do about actual chess in reality. And I love the show. I do think it's important to note that I think even what I just said is not necessarily true because it actually just isn't a show about chess. Chess is just a vehicle of the show. It really is. And so what you said is true is that you don't need to know anything about any chess. The show... Game. Yeah, the show's not about chess. Like it could have been tennis. It's uh, chess is just the vehicle in which the show's told in, and I'm, I mean, obviously, it's not 
completely accurate, but it's based on a real life woman. Uh, but it's just like the vehicle that the narrative of the show is told through. The the show's much more about the characters and the interactions and various subjects and themes we'll get into. But yeah, you can watch the show without knowing anything about chess. It's it chess is just the vehicle that the show drives in. Yeah. So to start the show off, uh, Beth has a really fucked up backstory. Her dad was just a horrible person in general. And her mom was a little bit off, I want to say. Like, you could tell that she suffered from some type of mental illness, for a fact. They give you several flashbacks of her mom. And in the beginning, her mom essentially does a... Tries, tries to do a double a double suicide. Is, you know, trigger warning. But her mom tries to kill herself and Beth in a car accident. Intent, it's intentional. You know it's intentional from the very first scene. But yeah, her mom doesn't make it and Beth survives. Beth becomes an orphan immediately. No one comes to claim her and she ends up in this orphanage and they do the orphanage thing where it's really bad. You know, like the kids are all strange. They all seem doped up or kind of without a personality. She meets uh, some girl named Jolene who quickly becomes her friend. But they're also giving the kids these tranquilizers at the orphanage and they naturally have, you know, what kind of special uh, green pills, baby. Special pills that definitely they're tranquilizers you find out later on or whatever. But she she has those kind of the adults there are very strict. She has this one lady who's just an asshole that like just by default. And she lies about the kids age that they get adopted. All types of fuckery is going on. It's this is like the grimy, nasty place that you'd expect it to be in this kind of show. So you want to paint that very atmospheric thing. Also, this is taking place in the 60s. So women do not have as many rights as they do right now in 2022. Uh, definitely still looked at as second class citizens, and I'll tell you why a little later. But essentially, yeah, Beth starts off as this kid. She has a nice head of hair, and when she gets the orphanage, they fucking chop her hair off in this disgusting bow cut. It's awful. They give her this nasty bang in the front. My girl is, they do my girl dirty. Like from the very beginning, they just do her dirty, they put her in these ugly ass clothes, cut her hair off, make it real short and cropped. It looks awful. And then they just kind of like, oh, you have to eat all your food. Otherwise, like, they'll tell on you, and then you'll be punished, and all types of crazy shit that... I, I just hate the idea of forcing kids to eat. I had that happen to me as a kid. I don't think that that is a good thing that parents should do. It's it's not necessary if a kid eats, and they're like, all right, I'm done. I think you should just let them be done. Like, it is what it is. But when you force them to eat, I think that just leads to all kinds of other problems. But we we can discuss that <laughs> over time. But basically, she's, like, forced to eat all her food, which I think is a terrible thing. Uh, again, they're giving them pills, which... I just don't understand why without any kind of medical diagnosis, you're just giving every child a tranquilizer, but go off. And yo, it's the, you already said it's the sixties, bro. Like they don't give a fuck in the sixties. They didn't give a fuck. They They did not give a fuck in the sixties. They also just, they also just didn't know. Right. Like to some degree, they didn't know everything. So they were like, I don't know. Doctor says these are fine. So we're going to give them away. I guess information is definitely a key, a key part in, the way people were treated back then, the more you know, the better society gets. So that there is some truth to what you say. Like, you're not off the mark. It just sucks watching how prehistoric some of this shit was that were being done that would never fly now, hopefully. At least not out in the open. Like, this place was actually an official orphanage, you know? Yeah. I mean? Like, it was operating probably it, with government money and everything. But uh, Additionally, like, um, they, once again, because of the 60s, the things like mental health still, like, very much back then weren't really cared about as yeah. much. So, like, giving them these drugs and not really caring about the repercussions, and then in addition to that, when they come off the drugs and, they, you know, they essentially are detoxing, like, all of that is just like, ah, pull it together, champ. Like, yeah, they, they don't really have much care yeah, for your mental, mental health state. health definitely did not become very popular, honestly, until recently. Like, yeah. mental health has literally become a popular mainstream topic, I want to say, like, 2018. It's very, very new. Which is crazy to think about. Like, we are at the dawn of mental illness and mental health being talked about as a mainstream subject now. It has not been discussed like this ever and, and, and until the last five or so years. And that's just crazy to think about because it is super important. It, it needs to, you know, it's something that we all need to take into consideration, uh, not only with raising children, but adults too. Like, adults definitely need to worry about their mental health. So, you know, this show definitely goes into both childhood mental mental health, but also adults too with her mom that adopts her. So Beth starts off, she meets her friend Jolene, black girl who's super real about everything. She kind of shows her the ropes. She tells her like, yo, you got to stop taking the tranquilizers as soon as they give them to you, like just fake swallow them. She teaches her that. Use them later on when you're about to go to sleep. They're much better then. 
Uh, you know, she's just kind of, she's that kind of person. She's like, I've been here for a while. I know how it is. I'm not going to get adopted because I'm too old already. And I'm too black. She says, so it's that, you know, it's the sixties. So there's a lot of like racial stuff going on too. As far as Jolene is concerned, she makes a comment later on, <laughs> like when they're older, but, but yeah, Jolene is very for a kid. She's like super real, like just super realistic. Like she's a realist. She knows exactly how it is. She already knows the world's a fucked up place. She's come to terms with it. And it seems like she just accepts it. Uh, whereas Beth is just kind of like floating around, not knowing where her place is. And she ends up meeting this janitor in the basement of the orphanage that is playing chess. And she's interested in what he's doing. And at first he doesn't want to show her, but he eventually does. And she just picks up on the game super fast. Now, this is where you realize that she's actually just a prodigy. She's a genius. Uh, she's a mathematical genius, too. Like, she's just naturally good at certain things. Now, it's speculated by people. I've read, like, forums and stuff like that and articles that Beth may be, like, autistic in some way or whatever. And they say, like, autistic people sometimes are really good at, like, mathematics or art and things like that. So she may be autistic, even though it's never fully confirmed in the show. But she picks up on chess extremely fast. And almost immediately, she starts beating this guy who's like, uh, I want to real quick say, I want to real quick comment on that. That's something that happens really commonly. And I think people think it's like accepting. It's something that I, it's one of those armchair psychology things that annoys me. Whenever there's a fictional character that's moderately good at math, people are like, I think they might be autistic. <laughs> it's like sometimes people can just be good at things. Like, you know, I understand that. I feel like people are trying to say in a way like, oh, it's really cool they put a autistic character. But it's like, so, I feel like it happens so often. If a character is just moderately good at math, the internet goes, I think they have autism. So I think that it's like, can you fucking relax? I do think that the show kind of insinuates it only because she's also super socially awkward. And that is like one of the main things that you can tell about autistic people in general. Like, yeah. That is that is but one of the main, not just the also, math. If it was just math. a car math, accident with her mom. <laughs> I understand. But you could tell that this little girl has, like, she's naturally just very, very socially, I won't say inept, but it takes her a while to realize, like, how things really work. And it, even when she's a fully realized adult at the end, you can tell she still just kind of has this, uh, interactions with people are not her strong suit. Let's just say that. I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Anyways, so she, she learns chess really quickly, and she starts beating the old guy. And he's teaching her all these different moves, and he's giving them names. And she's picking up on them. And then every night when she goes back to her room, she takes her tranquilizers and she stares up at the ceiling and she develops this insane ability to basically play chess without actually being in front of the, the pieces or the game at all. She just visualizes the eight by eight board, the 64 spaces and all of the pieces and all these different moves and shit. And so every time she plays them, she just trounces them to the point where he's so impressed by her that he brings in a guy who's another chess player who's like probably better than him. And she beats both of them. And they're like, yo, she's a marvel. Like, she's insane. And the guy starts taking pictures of Beth, and Beth doesn't understand why he's doing that. She doesn't get, like, what's going on at all. She just thinks, like, this is a fun game. This is pretty much... she's obs She gets obsessed with it. Like, it, it gets to a point where Beth wants to do nothing else with her life besides play chess, and the janitor at one point kicks her out, and every day she goes back to the basement door, she's trying to get in, and he's just, like, icing her out. Like, he's not letting her play. He knows that she wants to really badly, but eventually she does get back to the basement, and she plays more... And it's her favorite thing. Little after that, she finally gets adopted. And I think that this is where the show really picks up. So episode one is like all of that set up, you know, her being an orphan, her, her mom dying in a attempted double suicide type of thing. And her meeting her friend Jolene, her realizing that she she does become addicted to these these tranquilizers, by the way. There is one quick scene in episode one where she they stop giving them to her and she goes to steal some. And yeah, it's like a whole because the, the the government, the government or whoever, right? Time passes and they learn more about these drugs and they're like, hey, we can't be giving these to kids. Yeah. So sort of like a, a statute comes down stopping uh stopping these facilities from giving these drugs to kids. But yeah. she's addicted to them now at this point. And yeah. like she's going through a, a detox, you could argue, and uh and yeah, so she fucking breaks in. She goes, she goes through some real crackhead behavior. Like she fucking sneaks she really out, does. breaks in, and then like takes a handful of the pills and just like eats them. Yes. And uh yep. ODs so, <laughs> like to a degree. Yeah, it like, gets she crazy. just fucking falls out. But the good thing is on all of this, she does end up getting adopted, and then episode two comes around. And this is this is where the show really, really picks up, especially again if you're a competitive gamer of any kind or ever have been. This episode is so relatable. So her mom, the woman that adopts her, the family that adopts her, uh, they used to have a child that passed away. 
And her adopted father is very visibly not okay with Beth Harmon. Like he doesn't want an adopted child. It's very clear. He also just leaves pretty much in the same episode and never comes back. And you know, her mom, her adopted mom, she's a really nice person, but you can tell that she goes through depression. She likes to drink a lot. Uh, she also likes to take pills uh, to soothe her, you know, natural discomfort with life. Like she's just a depressed woman and she's a pianist, but because of the times, no one takes her seriously. And it really sucks mm -hmm. because she's talented. But again, in these times, like it's very hard for women to be taken seriously as anything other than like a secretary. Like and I watched the show Mad Men, which takes place in the sixties. And it's the same type of thing. Like women are just looked at as second class citizens. It's really fucked up, but that's the reality of the situation. So when, when Beth gets adopted, you know, she gets close to the mom, but then the dad is just like, I want nothing to do with her essentially. And then he leaves and then he sends a letter back saying like, I'm going to be on an extended stay wherever he goes. Like I'm not coming back anytime soon. And I think that her adopted mom realized with that real, like he's never, he's never coming back. Like she knows. Uh, Dude, but go ahead. I honestly think, so I think that like part of him going through with adopting Beth Harmon, uh, well, Beth at the time, I guess, right? Because she only becomes Harmon afterwards. But part of him going through with adopting that is because he knew he was leaving. Like, I think he he was like, I'm going to adopt this kid so that my wife can just shut the fuck up and, like, we'll have somebody. And then he's like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Yeah, like, I mean, she'll he does... have like, a thing to take care of. Because, like, he rolls out quick. He's like, yeah. I, I'm, I don't know. He why does I'm doing say this. exactly how it was later on, like, episode six. When he comes back and he's an asshole, he's a terrible person, but we'll talk about that a little later. But yes, he never intended to come back. He leaves pretty quickly and it's so bad. And this, this almost confused me the first time I watched it. They're like, yo, we're going to lie about his return so that that way we can like keep you. Otherwise, she'd have to give Beth back to the orphanage, apparently. I was like, damn, it's that bad. Mm. Like a woman is not allowed to just have an adopted kid. And I guess at that time, this is when people... And maybe the government is still this way. I just don't know how adopting works, but they really want you to have a two parent household. I know that that's, that's still a thing right now. Like I know that that's like a big thing for adopted children to have a two parent household. But the idea that like if one parent, for whatever reason, leaves the household, that the other parent can't just raise the child and then you'll take them back. I think yeah. that's really traumatic. And it's kind of crazy that like they had to lie about the father so that they can keep Beth and not make her go back to the orphanage. Yeah, it's it's pretty fucked up. I do think maybe less so now, but from what I've heard from various friends, it is still somewhat similar. Um, and that like, you know, if you get adopted and something happens, like it they place more like you have to be better. Like you you you, you they place more restrictions and more qualifications on like the adopted parents than they would on a normal yeah. parent. You know what I mean? Yeah, so Beth, she gets this, she gets adopted by this family, and she has, the house is beautiful that they, they bring her into. She has this gigantic room, and Beth even says something like, this is, this is all my room? And they're like, yeah, yeah. like, this is all, like, this is your room, yeah. This, her life had just been so shit prior to that. Uh, so, to her, it's just a surprise to see, and the room is nice, like, it's, it's gigantic, it might be bigger than my current room. Like, it's really nice, she has a fucking sick room. And how, like I said, the house is really nice. Everything's really great. Like, there's really nothing to complain about. Fast forward, Beth starts learning about chess tournaments. Now, you already know that she's pretty obsessed with it when she was at the orphanage, but now she's out, and all she's thinking about is, how can I get back into the scene? So she learns about tournaments, and she goes to her first one. She doesn't know anything. She has no idea about, like, how to sign up, uh, how, what do you do when you win, like, how to figure out who your opponent is round one she knows nothing and this just reminded me of the first time i ever played in a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament like showing up to your first local i was with i was accompanied with my dad when i first started going to like Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments but i didn't know anything like i didn't know how it worked i just knew i had my cards in my book bag and i wanted to play Yu-Gi-Oh, and that's pretty much it like the rest of it you know all the the small details like about signing or writing your name down match slips like they literally have match slips which i thought was hilarious <laughs> she beats her first round opponents another girl surprisingly and she beats the girl really badly like it's not even close uh and when she she gets the match slip, she goes back up to the guys who are basically just rude to her because they're like what the fuck are you here for you don't know how this works like you didn't do your research they're just kind of 
gate they give me gatekeeper vibes the, the two the twins and they're throughout the entire series they become fans of her later on but at first they're very gatekeepy and just kind of naturally rude as people often are when you're joining a community for whatever reason sometimes you meet nice people sometimes you don't so these are the not nice ones and uh when she comes up with the match she's like what do i do with this and they're like you won and she's like yeah and beth is already fucking cocky like to the point where when she was signing up she tried to sign up for a tournament with like other masters and they're like that's not how this works you can just jump the gun you have to yeah. play in like little leagues first before you can even play in a tournament with bigger people so basically you have to play in dragon duels is essentially what they told you have to get you have to get her elo yeah she has to get her she wasn't she was a wood player and she was trying to go into diamond lobbies yeah. and they were like relax like yeah kind of they literally up. told her you gotta play in dragon duels first and of course no one knows that she is a prodigy or that she's literally strangely enough her first tournament she's the best person there so she trounces the girl she trounces her next couple opponents and they're just surprised like the people there are genuinely shocked that this little girl with this really fucked up haircut is just running through the competition never saw her before don't know where she learned the game from but she's just beating literally everyone and they're like all right well your next match is against an actual guy who like is the state champion his name is harry beltic and she plays against harry beltic and she's she's doing well, but then in the middle of the game, she like has to go to the bathroom. Her period comes on. It's this whole weird thing. And uh, <laughs> she starts taking more of her pills. She like berates herself. But then when she comes back after taking her, you know, her amps, she comes back and she's like super duper cocky. Like, and this is one of the things that I guess makes Beth so hu- like she's so human in a way because she knows she's good. She just doesn't know that she has so much more to learn, but she's aware. She's fully aware that she's like really fucking good. She comes back and she's beating the state champion at this point. Everyone's watching and he's sweating. He's very frustrated. And there's a line that she says where she knows she won already. I did this to somebody at one of my earlier Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments. She basically lets him know there's nothing that you could possibly do from this point that like you've played into my hand essentially so at this point there's no outs for you like i calculated the possible moves that you can make and she says do you see it now or should we play it out on the board and that line the way she stares at this mind you he's much older than her like beth is very young i don't know exactly how young but i want to say she's probably 12 or 13 in her first tournament she's extremely young and she's she got her period in the middle of the tournament for the first time so like she's young yeah 12 or 13 so literally yes she just got her first period, and uh, she didn't even know what to do, really. Like, the girl, her first-round opponent actually helped her out with it, which was really cool. And they kind of become, like, this... not I wouldn't say friends, but it's, like, this respect thing. Like, you're a girl who's the shit, and I respect you. Like, the other girl feels that way. Like, I've been playing chess. I'm not really that good, but I like to play it, even though it's considered, like, a guy's kind of game. It's very male-dominated. And, yeah, she beats mm-hmm. Harry Beltic, the state champion, which is wild. And immediately after that, not only is she very cocky... But her mom, because Beth wins and earns some money, her mom realizes, oh shit, like this kid is a prodigy and there's money to be won, which they need, by the way, because remember the the father is out the house. So like whatever the mom is doing for money isn't exactly going to be enough to cut it. That's just how it was back then. Uh, Women were, you know, people talk about the, the wage gap now in 2022, but I'm sure it was way more severe in 1960 when the story is taking place, like in the 60s. So yeah, her mom, whatever she does for money, it's not enough. And Beth is bringing home quite a lot. Like, for the time that they're in, Beth's winnings are pretty insane. And her mom's counting, and she's like, holy shit. Like, are there any more tournaments? Her mom's like, and Beth's like, yeah, there's all there's tournaments all over. Like, they start looking in the paper, and her mom is essentially really happy about it. She kind of looks at Beth as a cash cow, but not, it's weird. She definitely weaponizes her daughter. No question about that. But it doesn't seem with malicious intent. And I don't... It's interesting how the show does that. Like, her mom is genuinely a good person. And you, I don't ever feel like her mom's intent is like, I want to use my daughter in a way to, like, pay my bills or to live this lavish lifestyle. It's more so, like, my daughter wants to do this already. Like, flat out. Like, my daughter... what This is what she wants to do. Like, she comes up with excuses for her to skip school and all this stuff just so that they can travel and do it. So it's like Beth wants to do this, but we also need the money. So this is like a win. We both win, right? Like it's a win-win situation and she capitalized on it, which I didn't, I didn't really find anything wrong with it. So I really like that. And even more to stress that is when they go to their first tournament, they have to take like a bus 
and they calculate like if we win this is how much we'll get and even if you got second place you know this is what happens and the break even point is here like her mom does all the math and everything like that to work it out like what would happen in these different scenarios but essentially it comes out to them traveling around and winning tournaments and her mom is like hey beth do you mind if i get a cut like a 10 percent cut and after beth had won a, a pretty big tournament she's like how about you just take 15 so her mom asked for only 10 percent as a commission like an agent commission which is that's like nothing like 10 percent is nothing especially for the fact you're literally traveling around with this little girl you know taking her everywhere booking hotel rooms travel food like doing everything you have to do uh but she's like i only want 10 percent, and beth is like how about 15 which i thought that i thought i love that scene like i i think that that was so cool and she calculates the math instantly it's not so how you haggle no it's not you start high and then the way down <laughs> she was, she, she, like she was like give me 10 she's like uh here have 15 it's like you're supposed to you're supposed to tell her five yeah Beth. you're supposed to tell I, her five and then you guys settle at seven i like that neither one of them <laughs> trying to really get over because i think 10 is super low like i think the mom lowballed herself and i think beth also felt like that's not a lot like beth is really good at math and she does this really quick math at that time where she calculates how much money her mom should get out of her newest winning and She's like, you were always great at math, Beth. And, you know, they have like one of those little scenes just kind of further iterate that she's not just good at chess. She's also just kind of a natural math prodigy. Uh, also, in something that's, uh, go ahead. real quick before we go a little further, something that's just cool that'll come up later is that um, before this, like she what she didn't really get too much support from her mom at first, because like there's a point when like she wants to buy a chess set and her mom's just like, no, like there's like some points where she wants to do stuff and her mom doesn't really get it. It doesn't really support it and so that first tournament she enters she ends up resorting to sending a letter back to her old janitor and like ask him to borrow money and that she'll yeah. pay him back so that janitor who essentially was her first and in a way only actual father figure to a degree yeah. in her life uh, real shit though said uh sends her the money and um that that is a little bit important later but then after that she doesn't have to ask and like find money from other places anymore or find support from other places because then her mom sees like, oh, what she's doing actually, you know, can make money and then everything Fraser said yeah. and then we go forward. The other thing that happened in this episode is she meets a guy named Towns. He's just this attractive, heartthrob looking guy, your typical, like conventionally beautiful white guy. And at the time, you know, obviously he doesn't think anything of her because he's again, like everyone else, all the other guys that she they're all older than her. And I want to say that these people look like they're already adults. At least 18, right? You would say? Yeah, I don't know what the smoking age was in 1960, but there's multiple scenes of just, like, smoking the fucking bit. Like, everybody's smoke smoking. While they play, yeah. It's interesting. Like, yeah. Beltic looks old enough to be, I want to say, 18. Like, he... I, I don't know, man. It's hard to tell sometimes. Uh... <laughs> it is. At youngest, I do feel like they're seniors in high school maybe at the like, very at the youngest possible they are yeah. seniors in high school and seniors in high school is like 17 18 i was 17 when i graduated yeah, high school yeah. a lot of people are 18 most people are probably 18 so i want to say they're 17 18 at the at the earliest they could easily be teenagers like late late teens 18 19 um something like that but they are they're much older than her so there's no romantic thing going on at all and also again not only is beth young but even if she wasn't with the haircut that she has, she just she doesn't fit in with the girls who are her age anyway. Like her haircut is I can't stress it enough. Her haircut is so fucking bad. I'm that man was, is going ham on her. Haircut. It's just so bad because even after she meets the other girl chess player, who's who's a re very regular haircut, like she just has re regular hair. She kind of looks at Beth. It's like oh, okay, and there's even a scene where Beth goes to the library to kind of look for chess books. And a girl talks about her like Beth's appearance. Like that's a whole that's a whole thing. She talks about Beth's shoes. Yeah. I would never fucking wear those shoes, she says. And just like Beth's, you know, the way she looks, she's kind of fugly. But anyway, so yeah, on to episode three. And this is this is also a really cool part. Actually, I want to talk more about what happens in episode two with the whole first tournament thing and like her ego. So it's natural for people to, especially when you are like a big fish in a small pond. For you to, when you branch out, you still think you're hot shit. You still have that ego. And then you go somewhere else and you kind of get smacked down. Uh, that's how it normally happens. But Beth has an interesting storyline where she was a big fish in a small pond, being that the only other chess player she really played was the janitor. And she trounced him and his friend. And then 
you would kind of expect her to go to her first tournament and maybe suffer a loss or maybe come close to it, but like she just destroys them. So that's that's one of those things that when I was making my notes about this show, I was like, she's not normal in that way. Like when I went to my first tournament, I did not do well. Like full disclosure, I was not hot shit my first tournament. Like I actually when when she plays when she plays against uh the you know the the boss of the tournament I forget his name but Beltic? he shows up late remember yeah Beltic he shows up late and like he acts like it's nothing and obviously that's all part of his mind game yeah he shows up late and he like sits down and he's like yawning when she takes her moves and it, that does throw her off her game a little bit and she gets kind of wobbled and then when she goes and like re centers herself and comes back and kicks his ass and when she does the thing where she's like you know you when she tells him that he already lost him? yeah. There's also a part where he's like, no, I can still win. And then she goes, maybe, if you got here on time. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's such an ignorant line. She's so cocky. Well, I like that part about her, but I just want to put it into perspective that this girl is such a prodigy that when I think about like Yu-Gi-Oh! and going to your first tournament, most Yu-Gi-Oh! players do not win their first tournament, especially against what I would consider Beltic to be because he was the state champion. So he's kind of like a, a guy that has won a regional in Yu-Gi-Oh! Which for me, when I was yeah. a young teenager, would have been Steve Silverman, and like the the me that met Steve Silverman could not have beaten him, like without a, a lot of luck. I even close. Yeah, like I, I and compared to him at the time, I was just like trash. Like I didn't know, I didn't even know about metagame.com when I arrived at my first tournament. I had no idea it existed. I didn't know what a YCS champion was. I didn't. I didn't even know what a regional was. So like, if I ran into somebody like Silverman, he would have just two owed me, and I'd have been like, God damn, what the fuck, like. Luckily, he was not at my first ever tournament, but just to put it in perspective, like this guy, because Silverman had won regionals around my area at the time, but this guy is like really, really good to be the state champion, and she just like destroys him, and it just further adds to her ego, which, you know, plays a role later on. The episode three comes around, and she meets an actual grandmaster named Benny Watts. I love this guy. He's actually Jojen Reed from Game of Thrones, so if you know who I'm talking about. Uh, he's dressed like a cowboy, though. He's very weird. He has like a knife on his side, a cowboy hat. Genuinely dressed like a cowboy, very Southern, like kind of accent, even though he lives in New York. And he shows up to one of the tournaments that she goes to. And he says something I thought was so cool, but also he's very cocky too. So she, they have a conversation and she, he tells Beth that Beltic could have beat you. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah, like he could have beat you. Uh, you misplayed here. This is what could have happened. And he's like, look at it. And she's like, why would I do that? And he's like, just go ahead, like study it, like go back to the board, set it up and just check. So that's one part of the conversation. But the other part is that she asked him, are you going to play today? Because now she's angry. She's like, I want to bust your ass. So like, I like the sportsmanship from Beth is like, I don't want to talk back and forth with you anymore. I want to play you dog. Like, I'm over all the back and forth. So she's like, I want to play you. And he says, oh no, I'm not entering this. I can't be seen entering too many openings. It can only hurt me if you know what I mean. And something about that line, like I get it. Because there is a certain kind of mystery and uh, a power level associated with being a pro and not entering, let's say, a local tournament or a regional tournament. And even yep. like I relate this to Yu-Gi-Oh! Because not only did I do it after I won a YCS, but a lot of other pros do not play in regionals. It's, they, they, they have more incentive to do so now because you get world points now. But there was a no stretch. Points, yeah. yeah, you get world's points for playing in regionals now, which is like really important. But there was a stretch of the game where you would not really see the best of the best playing in regional tournaments. Uh, or if they did, they wouldn't play like their actual real deck they were going to use for a YCS. They would just like troll and play something else to see if they could top with it. So when Benny says that line about, I can't be seen playing in too many openings, it can only hurt me if you know what I mean. Like she doesn't get what he means yet because she's not on his level, like a grandmaster level. But he's basically saying like, I don't want to be too accessible. And if I lose, remember, it means everything if I lose. But if I win these tournaments, it doesn't mean much. So yep. I totally get what he means. It's like the, the whole, if a dog barks at the moon, like it, it's not anything, but if the moon barks back, it's news. It's that type of thing. Like I, I have everything to lose and you have nothing to lose. So if Beth beats him, and it's not like he's necessarily scared of her, but like, because he already knows that she misplays and stuff like that. So he's like, I know that she's not perfect, but yeah, he wasn't entering. He wasn't entering the tournament regardless. He was never like, entering. He's just here. Like he, he was. He was never like just because you happen to be here. It's like that's cool, and like you know, playing you would be interesting. But yes. I was never entering this tournament to begin with. And I show up to regionals all the time. A lot of other really good players they show up to regionals and they don't play. And people are like, Why are you not playing? It's like, uh. 
I just kind of came to watch the competition. Like, it's kind of fun. Like, watching, I'm so glad that the show put Benny Watts in it, a person that likes to spectate, even though they're one of the best. I think that's such a cool thing because a lot of my friends even would ask me, like, how come you never play? Like, what, you know, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, I, I just don't see the point. Not only that, like, the prizes suck. Like, it's just not worth it. And if I lose, then you got people taking pictures of the match slip, which has actually happened. And it's probably happened to a lot of people. But it's just like, all right, like, relax. So I get what he means. He's like, it, it, it can only hurt me. You know what I mean? So he doesn't need the money. He's not getting any prestige from winning a regional. It doesn't really do anything for his ego or anything. It's just like, yeah, me just being here strokes my ego naturally. So younger me definitely enjoyed being a YCS champion, showing up to a regional, not playing, technically being undefeated because I didn't play, right? And like just having people look at me like, oh, that guy's really good, but never being able to actually see me play, which is like, you know, there, there's a whole mind game in that. And then when you finally do play, people are so scared because it's not normal to see you play. Like there's an intimidation Dude, there's a, associated with that. There's a scene after Beth starts to get known because she's playing in tournaments and she's you know going with her mom to tournaments. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where she goes up, she goes to sit down at a, at a table and uh, the guy looks to see who he's playing and she says like, I'm Beth Harmon. And he goes, shit. <laughs> yep. Like he knows. He knows. She's because there was a whole and this episode had a whole traveling montage with her mom where they're going around the tournaments and they're just destroying everybody. She wins every tournament. She gets put in the paper. But honestly, the only thing that they print about her is that like she's a woman, essentially. They don't really care about how good she is as a player. Uh all the printings about her just talk about how good she is for a girl. And that really pisses Beth yeah. off. And this is an episode, episode three, where you get the the interview. With, I guess it was it like Time Magazine or something. It was some really high up there. Life, it was Life. She gets interviewed by like Life Magazine, and the the woman is just being an asshole for a lack of a better word. Like we talked about it a little earlier, but she asks her all these questions that are just trying to allude to Beth being crazy. She even says there's a thin line between genius and insanity, something along those lines. She says like, did you look at the pieces as, as parental figures? Uh, do you ever think about like harming yourself? Just like questions like that. These really weird like off-putting questions that you really shouldn't be asking a child at all and making these wild assumptions. And Beth is just kind of like genuinely confused about it. So she's aware like these questions are wild, but like not, not in a way that an adult would, like not in the way her mom who steps in and stops is like, all right, that's enough. Like we're done here. Like we're wrapping up. Like her mom intervenes because yeah. it progressively gets worse. Um, she also just has like an attitude the whole time because like she's just sitting She's asking the questions, but she's just sitting in a chair. And if I remember, she's like smoking and she just kind of as she's asking the questions, she also gives off this air of like not caring. It's weird. Yeah. It in a way, like, she like she's, she's trying to invested. press for a story and she's interviewing this person, but she's also just like doesn't really care. Yeah. So it's like this you weird tell, dichotomy she has. You can tell that because she is what you would consider a conventional woman in that, in that time, that the idea of playing chess to her is just kind of like, yeah. Like, why would a woman ever want to do that? I don't I don't see this as being something that I would ever do. Also, like at the time, they're they're photographing Beth with her trophies and stuff. And Beth is kind of off to the side a little bit. It's The whole scene is filmed. It's a, meant to make you feel uncomfortable. They do a really good job of it. But something that Beth says that I love is that she says, I'm good with being alone. And I also like chess because I can I can control it. I can dominate it. The 64 spaces like I love that area. It makes me feel safe. So she does say like this one thing that, you know, might give the reporter something to make Beth sound weird in a way. Like if you take it out of context, right? If somebody said chess makes me feel safe, I like this predictable 64 space zone. Like it's something that they could like, you know, embellish, right? So she says that and I, I understand what she means because even, you know, growing up playing Yu-Gi-Oh is the thing I did the most with my childhood. Like that was, I played a lot of video games, you know, I did Pokemon and stuff like that, but Yu-Gi-Oh was the dominant thing that I did. and. There is a safeness associated with, let's say, being at a local surrounded by people who play Yu-Gi-Oh, as opposed to playing Yu-Gi-Oh in a school cafeteria where kids will walk by and be like nerds or, you know, whatever it is. Now, lo and behold, I'm getting paid to do a fucking podcast called I Am Nerd. And like, <laughs> what are they doing? Right. Yeah. It's just like life, life has a funny way of uh, dealing with things. But it's also cool because like it, it shows that <clears throat> it shows that even at pretty young that she's aware of the lack of control she has over her own life and the world. Because, yeah. like, her entire life up to this point has been completely out of her control. Like, she was almost murdered by her mom, Yep. Uh, you know, without any real control. Then she ends up going into an orphanage, and she's treated like she's in an orphanage. And then, in a way, she... <coughs> 
excuse me, the only thing that she ever gets to do in her control is almost force her way into learning chess and like forcing like her worth in the learn chess with this guy. But then like that gets taken away from her more than once at the orphanage. Mm-hmm. And then she gets adopted and she's thrown into this new thing with this, sh- this shitty new dad. And then she's at school and people make fun of her and she doesn't really understand much about sex and the human body. And then she's on drugs and she slowly gets introduced to like liquor and alcohol and her whole life has been kind of chaos and out of her control. But when she plays chess, that's her fucking domain expansion, yeah. right? Like she, it's like she's in her zone. And in this world, she controls everything that happens. And she even says, like, if something bad happens to me, I know it's my fault. And that that implies obviously that like all the things that happened in her life that were bad, like very clearly, it wasn't all her fault. Like things happened to her, and there was nothing she could do about it. Right. Whereas in chess, if think if something happens to her. She knows it was her fault, and she could have done something to control it or alter the outcome. Yeah, I really like that point of view, too, because this, she does say, it's predictable, I can control it, I can dominate it. That word specifically, dominate, and that's what she liked to do. One of the comments they make very late in the series is that Beth always wins her matches in the first couple turns, like the beginning of the game and the mid-game. She does, she's not known for having an endgame. Her last opponent, Borgov, that's like his, he's known for specifically that. Obviously, he's just the best player. But he's also known for closing. And Beth is known for winning early. So if she doesn't do that, then they're kind of like, what happens, right? But no one's ever gotten to really see it. So another thing that happens in this episode is that she... Oh, you want to say something? I was going to say something that's really interesting about that. I know you said you don't know much about chess. I'm not like a, obviously a chess god. But I do have uh, a, some understanding of chess. Something that's interesting and that you'll hear from a lot of people that play chess is that there's a lot of chess games where... You win in the first four turns, but you have to play for the next two hours just to prove that you Holy win. Holy shit. But, like, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of chess, especially high-level chess. Like, low-level chess, you know, you win in 30 minutes. But in, in a lot of high-level chess, within the first four or five turns, you know that you've won. Yeah. But you have to play for the next two hours just to, like, prove that you won if the other person doesn't concede or offer a draw. Um, But something that's really interesting and, and something that you hear from people is that what would really makes like Borgoff, for example, so good. And like the idea of winning in the end game is that typically if it plays out the way it's supposed to, when you get to the end game, like you've already, whether or not you won or lost the side an hour ago, but the people that are, have really strong end games at chess are really good at just throwing off the pace, doing things that are sl- might seem unconventional and really making it so that like, even though you had a game state that you were guaranteed to win if you just followed whatever this plan was, they throw you off with their moves and how they play so much that they create these opportunities for you to make mistakes and for them to turn around and win, even though they should have lost and a lesser player would have lost. Yeah, chess is, I mean, a lot of people have told me throughout my life that I probably would be really good at chess because I'm one of those people that when I do play games, I get extremely competitive and focused and like it's very hard to shake me out of it. Like if you ever watch me play, I am so into the game that almost nothing from the outside world matters to me anymore like i don't really hear but people are like you don't hear like i don't hear shit i don't care about anything else going on all i'm focused on is the game and apparently that's like a really good skill to have in chess is to just be like super laser focused and kind of you know in that world uh but yeah this this episode three is probably to me like the best episode because it also has the time skip so in this episode she does get to try out alcohol because her mom gives it to her and they go through the whole thing of Beth mentioned how she likes being alone and she's fine with that. She is kind of weird. She at a young age, she kind of just knows who she is. It's not normal for kids to know exactly who they are, but she does end up going to a party. She tries to like socialize someone with classmates and they say, is there any guy that you're interested in? And she's like confused about it. And then they ask her if there's anyone that she wants to trade with Rooks with like bump Rooks with. And she's like, yeah, um, yeah. she's like, uh, not really. Like I don't, like, I don't really follow, basically. And she, yeah, just, she, she even says, she says, I, I trade rooks all the time. Like, yeah. she's she's still, like, in, in the chess mindset. Like, she doesn't realize that they're using it as a euphemism. Yeah, they're trying to be funny because they 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 figure, in a way, they're, like, teasing her. They're like, oh, this is, like, your language, right? Like, we're going to, they don't know anything about chess. But they're like, this is your language. We'll talk to you in this way to be funny. And it, you know, it wasn't, like, a, a crazy, like, diss or anything like that. But they say it in a way to be kind of funny. And Beth answers it super serious. Right. Like she's just like, yeah. like, not really. Like I like I trade rooks, like it's not a big deal. And she goes to use the bathroom and then it time skips. And it time skips to Beth looking hot. And her hair is like 
way better finally like she has if you're watching us on patreon um she has a very nice like low cut still like it's not a low cut but like a very close flapper kind of cut like that kind of short crop style but it's curly very beautiful woman the woman who plays her i forget her name ann taylor joy ann taylor joy is fucking hot uh, i don't know what else she's from but in the queen's gambit I don't know if they're using a filter. She almost doesn't look real at times. Her skin just looks like fucking porcelain. Like they zoom in on, even if you're looking at this, uh, my background right now, like her, it just, it's, it's like beyond makeup. It, like she just looks like a doll and it's very anime-esque. Like the way yeah. her, I don't know, the way she is, it's just like, she gives me anime character a lot of the times, which is why I think a lot of people like her. Like a lot of guys like this show. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice to just see a female protagonist be the shit and be like dominating in a male dominant sport, right? Like this is a very male dominant world that she's in. But when they do this time skip, she's like walking. She has on heels. She's on like a nice dress and her hair is finally nice. Like she's super beautiful. She's wearing lipstick and shit. Like she's just like gorgeous. And she runs into towns who she is absolutely fucking smitten by. Like this guy, again, he's like a heartthrob. He's your typical... Like he's your typical heartthrob and he's only gotten better looking with time just like she did, but he notices her beauty. Like he, without saying it, you could see it on his face. You can see the way he appraises her when he looks at her, he's smitten by her too, but she's like looking at his eyes. You can tell when somebody's not looking at you, but they're looking at you. He's doing that type of thing. Both of them actually are. And, uh, it's this one awkward scene where he invites her up to his room to like play chess and to do an interview type of thing but there's always the question of is he really trying to get in her pants like is that is, is that kind of invitation right yeah. i also feel like she very obviously gave off energy where like <clears throat> she kind of she kind of wanted to go a little bit further too like she she, she wanted to play chess but she also was interested in like hey man i kind of want to yeah because i want to do a little more he's the guy that she has honestly had a crush on since she was a little girl and yep. now that she's older and, you know, hormones, you know, natural things have occurred. Uh, when they get up to the room, though, you know, he's like, I want to photograph you. I want to do a piece on you in a magazine. And he tells her to, like, pull out the chessboard, start playing, right? Like, pretend like you're playing. He's photographing her. She's looking at him and like this. Honestly, she's on. She gets on her knees, which I think was completely unnecessary. But again, it's because she's kind of given off this vibe of like, there's some sexual tension. And. He definitely picks up on it. He moves closer to her at one point and they're about to kiss. And then what I, this scene is so confusing to me. And if I'm way left field with this, you guys let me know in the comments or comment wherever you are listening to this episode, drop a like or whatever. I don't know. Do something to let me know how you feel about what I'm about to say. But this random guy barges into the room. Now this is Towns' room, right? But someone else has a room key to it. So he must be staying with this guy. This guy to me is homosexual. I don't care what y'all say. This guy to me is giving me homosexual. I think I think he's homosexual. I just I, I they say it takes one to know one. I think so too. I don't think it's a hot take. Okay. Talking about Towns, right? And obviously the guy that came in. The guy that came in, I I think is homosexual. And I think Towns is too. At the very least, bisexual. I think Towns is gay as well. I think Towns may be he may be bisexual. I guess because he was about to kiss her. Look like before the door before the guy barges yeah. in. Talented and her are blatantly about to kiss. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they get so close and they're staring at each other's eyes and like they come in for a kiss and the guy barges in and he's like, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt or whatever. Yeah. But like there's this really awkward energy when a guy shows up and you have to wonder. There's only one. OK, there's yeah. only one. Also, Beth, the because Beth is sitting there like Beth in her head. She wasn't like I think when the guy comes in, she's like, wait a sec. Like everything. You know what I mean? She's yeah. like. Is he gay? Like, she's yeah, like, I, I don't know if that, like, I don't know if he's putting two and it's still together. the 60s. Yes. Like, it's still the 60s. Oh, so. that's right. The 60s being gay was definitely not okay because as you saw in season one of Mad yeah. Men, a guy literally gets fired from his job because it's revealed that he's gay. And that's like season one so of Mad Men. So, that's the, the other thing. I do, I do feel like Towns, from my perspective when I watched it, is either gay or bi. And, like, he was just essentially putting on airs or you know because like it's the 60s like you yeah. can't just be like i'm gay 
Yeah, you also can't really turn her down blatantly, I guess. But I don't, again, this is the most confusing scene in the entire show for me. And I even wrote that in my notes. Like, this is a, it's an uncomfortable scene. It's very confusing. The guy barges in. And to me, him and Towns are lovers or they're like together. They hook up something. There's only, there's one, only one bed in that room. There's only one bed in the room. And like, yes, I've slept in a bed with guys before and nothing has happened. We've slept, uh, what is it called? Foot the face or face the foot or however you want to say it. Yeah. You know, I've also slept in a bed with a guy and we have not slept face to foot. We've slept at this, you know, both we're both facing the same way and everything like that. Like it's no big deal. Like if you're gay, like no one, or I should say if you're straight, sleeping in a bed with a guy does not make you gay. And it doesn't mean that something gay is going to happen. Like if you're a straight guy, like then that's all that matters. Like, you know who you are. So like there's, we're not saying that because there's only one bed in the room that that is the sole reason why we think they're gay. But I swear to God, this scene was directed Gosh, in a way to the insane. energy. The energy of this scene. Towns looks uncomfortable and kind of like he just got busted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, the energy in the room. Like I agree. It's not just because like it's not just like toxic male energy. It's not just like we're like well two guys in a room so they're getting no. It's you could tell the energy in the shot. The energy like they're they were giving off more because it does feel like. Towns is almost being like, oh shit, like this is kind of awkward. Like I got caught in a way. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, there was some awkward scene, but that scene just kind of goes away. She goes back to her room and she starts practicing, and she's practicing like the misplay that Benny mentioned earlier in the episode. Uh, she also mentions that she's like fearful of the Russian guy Borgolf, and her mom is telling her, you know, like just take it easy, whatever, like that. Which she kind of gets a little annoyed with her mom because she's probably annoyed with what happened with Towns earlier too. So her emotions are kind of. You know, hi. Anyways, the next day in the tournament, she finally plays against Benny Watts. She said some savage shit to her mom. Yeah, well, I'm, about her mom... Get, I'm about to get to that. So she plays okay. Benny. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. after Benny, though. So she plays Benny. Okay. He's, remember, Benny's a grandmaster, so he's the, he's the real deal. Up until this point, Beth has not played anybody on this level. She's played the master before, but not a grandmaster. So he's like the highest that you can be. Um, or I think that grandmaster is the highest anyway. I guess world champion, if that's a you know, if that's a specific class of person, then that's higher. Like, Borgov is a world champion. Anyway, she plays Benny. And during the middle of the game, you can tell that things are not going well. I don't, again, I don't play chess, but the, just the music and uh, the way Beth is breathing and the way they're kind of doing the camera angles, you can tell that she's actually, like, I want to say losing, but come to find out, they don't let us actually see the end of the game. It just kind of does a cut to her talking to her mom. And she's, like, clearly been drinking, too. You can tell that Beth is a little under the influence. And she's like, I didn't even see it. Like he slid the knife right in. I'm so bad. I'm so stupid. Like, how could I not have noticed? And her mom is trying to console her or whatever, but she's like, I'm so fucking dumb. Her mom's like, well, it's fine. Like you guys are just going to share the trophy. And like, apparently they drew, but the, yeah. the problem is Beth didn't even know that they were going to draw, which basically to her is a loss. This is the first time she's ever not won. First of all. So that's a big deal for her. Is like, not only does she not win, but she now has to share the championship. This is the U.S. Open, if I'm not... Yeah, this is the U.S. Open. So she's sharing the championship with Benny Watts, who she actually kind of despises because he's so pompous. Like, he's such an asshole. He came in telling her her misplays. He told her, like, oh, I'm not playing in this because, like, this is too low level for me. It would hurt me if I played in these types of things too much. Like, he's very... Uh, abrasive to her. She doesn't, you can tell she just doesn't, he's, she, she doesn't like him. Like, point blank period. She does not want to share a trophy with him. She's been waiting to play this guy so she could dog his shit. And now that she drew with him, and it almost seems like, and I don't think this is true, but it almost seems like he purposely drew with her just to like, kind of fuck with her. Like, I almost feel like, well, he, go I, ahead. I think what happened, if I remember correctly, she offered the draw, right? Did they show that part? I don't think she offered the draw because uh, they kind of just like cut. Hey. I don't because I, I don't, don't remember. I don't think Beth ever. I don't remember the, the exact anyone. scene. I don't remember the exact scene, but I know that like um, that's another weird like pseudo mind game of chess. Sometimes people like will offer a draw, yeah. and when they do it, it's just like they get the game over. Sometimes they do it because they see that they've lost, and so instead of playing for the next hour, they offer the draw, and then like the other person will accept or because like they don't want to play for the next hour or whatever. Yeah. And it's also chess has this weird uh respect to it like they even show in episode one when um i don't remember the, the exact thing but she was when she's learning from the janitor the janitor tells her that like when when, when this happens you have to accept it because it's the sportsman like thing to do and she's like well i don't want to do that like i want to keep playing yeah and he's like no no but that's not how you that's not like 
the respect of the game. Right. Like, and you so there's like this now. You can see. Res- yeah. And she was like, well, I don't want to. So anyway, um, a lot of times, like, when, when you offer a draw, that's or when you draw and you accept a draw, I think part of the reason why she she feels that's a loss so much is because, like, in a way, it is a loss. The fact that you even accepted the draw yeah, is you saying, like, think- oh... I, I could be wrong because uh, I watched all seven episodes in two days, but uh, for the second time, I am not 100% sure, but I don't think that she offered it. I don't think that's in her character, if I'm being honest. She could have. Maybe I missed it. But they kind of just cut. Like I said, they don't, I don't think they showed a the whole game play out. They just kind of do this thing where they're showing her. You can tell that she's not doing well in the game. She's not dominating him, which is what she does to everybody she's ever played, literally ever up until this point. She's 100% not dominating him. And then it comes to her having that conversation with her mom where she's like, like I said, a little intoxicated, it seems. And she's very emotional about it. Her mom is just basically trying to be like the good friend. Like, hey, it's okay. You know, you guys are just going to both share the title. It's whatever. You're both considered a U.S. Open champion. Uh, and she's like, you don't even know anything about chess. And her mom's like, oh, shit. But I do know what it's like to lose. And now you do, too. And I fucking love the way her mom gets her at the end with that. <laughs> because she, Beth is being mean to her mom for no fucking reason. Like, she just takes it out of her mom. Like, oh, you don't even know what this fucking game is about. Like, stop trying to, like, console me when you have no idea. And her mom's like, yo, calm down. Like, yeah, I don't know how to play chess. You are correct in that. But, like, I know what it's like to just, like, lose. Like, I know that feeling of loss. And Beth, like, makes another smart remark. And she's like, no, you do too. I just love, I love how her mom, her mom was like, all right, little bitch, like, don't get too snippy now. Like, I can give it back. Like, I can actually give it back to you. I can be mean too. Like, and her mom has this human moment where she says, like, that was a very human, petty thing that she did. She stooped down to her level. Like, when she said that, like, and now you do too. Because to Beth, yep. again, even though she drew, to her, it's a loss. And her mom is like, yeah, now you know what it's like to lose too. Because her record had been perfect up until this point. So, Benny Watts is her first quote unquote L. And, uh, yeah, it's Benny. I think they also mentioned at the end of that episode that Benny is an eight year old. He was an eight year old prodigy. Like he was insane. And he's one of those, like he'd been playing for a while. And Beth started a little later. I think she started playing at like 10 years old. Uh, I think in the interview that she has, or at least there's a part in the, in the show where somebody tries to insinuate that she started playing when she was like three. And she was like, I started when I was 10. Like, we're like, she doesn't want credit for anything that she did not do. I think the interviewer tries to make it sound like she's like bigger than she actually is. Like, oh, you've been playing since you were three. She was like 10. Like, just we're not doing that. Like, we're not about to sit here and cap to make myself seem bigger than I actually am. It's not that serious. But uh, yeah, she's after her whole fallout with towns or whatever you want to call that awkwardness. She does chug. Yeah, she does chug alcohol. So at this point, like they're showing a little bit of I I guess I can call alcoholism. Her mom loves alcohol, period. Like her mom just loves it very early on. They let you know. Her mom is all about drinking, and her mom also takes those pills, which Beth will start to steal. And uh, yeah. her mom makes a funny comment. She's like, "Why do they always fill these things halfway?" It's like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> yeah, like she really likes them, and she you knows she gives her a very young daughter. The first time she gives Beth a drink, like Beth is really young, like young teenager, and she still gives her an alcoholic beverage on a flight. So she lets her try it anyway. Uh, no, that's not that's not abnormal though. It's not like, like I think when I was young. I don't think my mom or my dad let me try a drink, but I'm pretty sure, like, someone in my family let me try a drink when I was pretty young, like, when I was a teenager. And I was like, okay. And I tried, and it was disgusting, because that's how alcohol naturally tastes. And I didn't do it again for, like, a very long time. But I definitely tried alcohol way before it was legally okay for me to do so, you know. So, and I know a lot of other people have, too, especially when I was in high school. Dear God. Kids talking about going down to the shore. It's just very normal. Even the party that Beth went to when she, like, before the time skip. Like the kids were drinking, like they were just fully drinking, and that's still a thing that um, obviously kids do now. But you know, the '60s, still that time, and uh, yeah, her mom, her mom has clearly some form of a drinking issue, a uh, coping mechanism for her for her depression, and this is important because in the next episode, like tragedy does strike, her mom and her they they go out of the country for a chess tournament. They and- do. Mexico? Yeah, I think it is Mexico. Or... And her mom has like this supposed pen pal dude that she knew for years, but she never met him. And he's like this Rico Suave guy that she really is all excited to meet. And Beth is kind of skeptical about this person too. But at the same time, Beth has to focus on the tournament. So she's not giving her full undivided attention to it, but she's kind of like, okay, like you're really in a good mood. 
And her mom's like, yes, I can't wait to meet him. And then she like, the first day after she meets him, she's like absolutely smitten by the guy, talking about how great he is. She gets taken in quick. She does. Her mom falls for this random, like, a foreigner super fast. And yeah, so Beth at this point is taking Russian classes uh, because she feels like at this, you know, I need to learn how to speak their language. I'm going to go play in the like the Russian Open or the Russian whatever it is, like the Invitational. It's like the biggest tournament. And that's how you become the world champion because you at that tournament, you get a chance to fight Borgov and he is the best in the world. So like beating him would make you at least for that year, like it's like winning Evo, it's like winning nationals or whatever, it's like winning world, I guess. Um, so she's like, All right, if I'm going to go there, if I'm going to go to Moscow, I should learn Russian. Uh, just so I'm like not completely out of it when they're speaking and stuff like that, which I think is smart. Like, her whole life yep. is dedicated to chess at this point, she knows exactly what she wants to do with her entire life. So it makes sense to me that she's like, Fuck it, I'm just gonna like learn Russian because this is a key part of my life at this point. So she's taking classes and she ends up going into this party with some kids in her Russian class. She has sex for the first time and it's terrible. It's a terrible, uncomfortable scene. Uh, the guy lasts for like five minutes or something, you know, a typical first time having sex scene. And Beth just kind of lays there. It's like, is that it? And he's like, yeah, sorry. It's usually better than this, but I had a lot of alcohol. He kind of blames it on the alcohol, but she's clearly, she did not enjoy it. It was not a good time for her. And she was just her. humping her. Like she was just laying there. Yes. It was like a really awkward, like it also once again, really gave those vibes of, I don't know if I'm going to also blame this on the sixties, but fuck it. I will. One of those things where it's like, he doesn't really care what the girl thinks. Like he's right. just there to get his nut. Yeah. And it, like whether or not she enjoys, it's not really on him. Yes. Cause I think at one point while he's humping her, she's like, how much longer? And he's like, I'm almost there. And yeah. Yeah. And then he's there, but like she's over it immediately. Uh, so she has this really like this not glamorous at all. Her first, I'm glad they didn't try to like make it seem like people's first sexual experience is some kind of glamorous Prince Charm. Like it's not, it wasn't with Towns in the beautiful room that they were in. The room, the room that she almost had sex with Towns in was was amazing. Like it was beautiful. It was like green and velvet, and everything was like super carpeted. It would have been like a fairy tale romance type of situation. But she ends up having sex in this really rundown, almost trailer park looking place with this guy who's just like, a just I don't know. He's just a nasty ass, grungy looking kid. Like he's just like you said, he was just there to get his. He didn't really care about her, and uh, she ends up doing a couple days like a weekend trip just with this group of people. And she calls home to her mom. Her mom's like, yo, I just want to make sure you're okay. And she's like, I'm, I'll be fine. I won't get pregnant. Like whatever, which is like, you know, really cool. Beth is, I love how self-aware she is. She's very self-aware. She's away from home. She knows she's like, her mom pretty much knows like you're having sex. Clearly like you're staying out. Like you wouldn't do that if it wasn't for a guy. Um, and she's like, watch what drugs you take Beth. Like, you know, like don't do anything too crazy. Like weed is one thing. And she, her mom probably knows that Beth, you know, we'll smoke a little pot, but she's just hoping that she doesn't get into anything a little bit more drastic. And, uh, yeah. So after her little, I'm gonna be honest, I kind of thought, it, I kind of thought it was funny when like, I think I, she does weed or whatever for the first time, but it's like, she's been doing fucking animal tranks since yes. she was 10. Yes. Weed, weed. I just feel like weed does nothing for you at that point. Yeah. She just smokes it. You remember her first time smoking weed? She just fucking, she just hits the weed and she's fine. And then like, <laughs> The next day, all of the people that she was with, they leave her. And it's this kind of a recurring theme with loneliness with Beth, right? Like, she ends up alone several times throughout the show. So, the people that she's with, they end up, like, kind of abandoning her. She ends up cleaning the entire place that they're in. And she's, like, getting high. She's, like, smoking. Mm -hmm. She's, like, she finds a little joint in an ashtray. She lights that shit up. She puts on some music. And she's, like, dancing and vacuuming and, like, cleaning the place up. And you see that she's completely fine with the fact that these fuckers have ditched her. Like she ain't mad. Uh, so I think it's just really cool that, you know, again, it just reiterates like I'm, I'm okay. Like people have been leaving me all her life. So anyway, she ends up in Mexico where her mom, her mom runs off with this guy. Her mom ends up getting sick. And weirdly enough, I didn't, I didn't really see it coming like this, but her mom does end up passing away. So before yep. her mom passed away, she did have this one conversation with Beth where she tells her like, yo, there's more to life than just chess. Like she leaves her. That's like the, the last conversation she has with her mom, because Beth, again, is super stressed out. She's like, I have to study. And then she's like, can you turn that down? Like her mom is like watching some soap opera or something. And she's like, can you turn it down? Like, can you not, you know, you're, everything her mom did was, was bothering her. She's an angsty teenager. 
and just like you're annoying me like oh my god i'm trying to study like what the fuck you know her mom t- tells tells her like you know there's more to it than just chess like there, i want you to have some semblance of life outside of this game and i do want to talk about that for a bit because i think being really competitive in something my experience being Yu Gi Oh, like you do kind of lose yourself for the competition and apparently this is still going on in the community but like people have i talked about how for the world's grind people going from regional to regional so saturday they'll go to a philly regional and then sunday they'll go to a regional in ohio and then the next weekend they'll fly out to california then they'll go to one in vegas on the, on the next day after the saturday regional and then they'll go to oklahoma and then the next day they'll go to fucking i don't know texas or something like they're just all over the place and you when you don't do well you're very angry a lot of times you take it out on your friends and you start to become a shitty person without realizing it like it's not intentional it's because of your love for the game. You're so passionate about the game. And I love that for people who are passionate. Like, I love the passion. Don't get me wrong. I've been there. But just try not to alienate yourself and try not to be a shitty person to your friends who are really not trying to do anything but look out for you in most cases. Like, they really just want the best for you, especially if they're looking out for, like, your health, your mental health. Sometimes when you're so deep in it, you can't see how deep in it you are that you're kind of off the deep end. And I'm speaking from experience right now. I've had experiences where I've talked to my closest friends in such a way that honestly, it's like one of my biggest regrets in life. Like it's still something that I feel like I'm always atoning for by being, I try to be like, I used to be really, really mean and really just nasty to anyone who would try to critique me or say anything bad about my plays or uh, even try to help me if I felt like they were trying to be condescending. Even if they meant well, like they could have been like, yo, like, hey, you misplayed, you could have done this or whatever. And I would just like really fly off the handle. And this is me. Like, again, I went to YCS when I was 20 years old and it went straight to my head. I mean, it honestly went straight to my head. I was a 20 year old when I went to YCS. And that is pretty young. Like not the, you know, some people have won when they're teenagers or whatever. God bless you. But like I won when I was 20 and that shit just, it definitely goes like your ego just blows up. And it can just turn you into a monster. Like I won't even say that it will it, it it transformed me because I think that people are who they are, and you really get to be your full self the further you get in life in certain things. Like when you see success, it kind of enhances who you are. So Beth, you know, as she has had success, she starts treating her mom shitty, like blatantly. She's just treating her mom bad. Like you can tell, like the conversations they have. She's kind of just like distant with, her, distant with her mom. She's kind of aggravated with her mom. Just being rude to her. Like her mom's not really doing anything. Like she's just being herself. Her mom's being the same person that she's always been. Um, but she's just being like naturally a dick to her mom. And so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that like from experience, like if you know that you have ruined some relationships with people that you used to be really close with, like maybe if those things are, hopefully you didn't say something that you can't recover from. Uh, but if you can patch those relationships up, it's never too late because her mom does end up passing after they have that last little spat where her mom tells her there's more to life than chess, chess Beth. And Beth doesn't even really respond to it. She's just kind of like, whatever. Like, yeah, okay. Kind of almost, it almost gives me a vibe. Like because her mom's life honestly has gone so poorly in Beth's eyes, like to her mom, I mean, t- yeah, to Beth, from Beth's perspective, like your husband left you when I got here. Uh, you're clearly depressed. You're suffering from all, like all kinds of other like mental health issues and stuff like that. Like you're off. You drink a lot, like, you know, you take these pills. She doesn't really have the highest opinion of her mom at the time. And later on, she does. But in the moment when it's happening, when you're, again, when you're really deep in it and all you care about is the game, you don't care about the people around you. Like you could tell that she's just lost herself a bit and she doesn't really respect her mom as much. And it's a shame because her mom, they show subtly. And like you said, you don't really realize that this is where it's going to go. But they show throughout the episodes that her mom is suffering and she's sick. And she even mentions that she's sick later on. Yep. And so when she ends up dying, in one way, it feels out of nowhere. But when you look at it, like there was a lot leading to her death. She clearly wasn't healthy. And then in addition to that, she could never really get any real help because she was struggling and doing everything she in, in her life without any real help. Like she was living her life and then doing everything she could for her daughter Beth, yes. while also still like it being a um, a mutual beneficial relationship, and that Beth was the one bringing home the bacon, so to speak. Yeah. But the mom was essentially, even if Beth didn't want it or acted like she didn't want it or was being a bratty teenager, the 
the mom was Beth's support network, whereas the mom herself didn't really have a support network. She, she no just one. kind of had but Beth. She had nothing. So and there was no one or any to really help her. So when she ends up passing away, like maybe that was preventable. Maybe she could have seen a doctor. But like yeah. through the time period and due to the, the situation she was in, she never really had the opportunity to get that help. And that's why she was so clingy with the Mexican guy, her pen pal, quote unquote. Like she immediately falls for this guy because she just wants to feel love again. And she wants to feel like her life has meaning. They do show her mom play piano a couple times throughout. Even when they go to tournaments, like there'll be, there'll be a piano in a tournament lobby, in the lobby of a hotel. Mm -hmm. And her mom will sit down and play. And it's beautiful. Like her mom was very clearly a pianist at heart. And that's what she would have done with her life. But just the times were so fucked that again, no one would take her seriously. Like even her own husband didn't take her seriously. So it just sucks that like, you know, she's this beautiful pianist and she has like stage fright. She mentions like, oh yeah, I don't like playing in front of people. But then when she finally gets encouraged to do so, eventually people gather around and they're like clapping and shit. Like she's doing a, she's doing a really good job. So she has something there, but yeah, I mean, in that episode, this is only episode four, by the way, but it seems like, I swear, the show seems so long. I felt like I had known her mom forever, but by episode four, she meets Borgov and she watches him play. And she sees him with his guys in an elevator and they're speaking Russian. And they are the two guys that Borgov is with, like the other two Russian pros, they are dissing the fuck out of Beth. They're talking about her in this really condescending way. And Borgov somewhat defends her. I do like what Borgov says. He he says like she's an orphan and like she's a fight. He says like she's like us. Yes. And so you don't you don't get a much about Borgov's backstory, but clearly you know that like in Russia it's shown in the show that like they're taking this very, very seriously and they're, they're putting a lot into it. And yes. so he makes it clear. Like he's like, she's like us, she's a fighter. And so like, she's nothing if she doesn't win. Yep. And, uh, and that's clearly how, you know, Russians, I guess, raise their kids in, in competitive ways too. So he relates to her in that way, but the other two pros just, they just say some really vile shit in the elevator. And Beth is actually in the elevator with them, but they don't know it. Borgov, he realizes and he kind of looks back. And she can speak Russian. So, like, she actually understands what they're saying. Or at least that's the insinuation that I got from it. But she understands what they're saying in that elevator. She doesn't say anything when she hears it, but she just kind of, like, she knows what they're saying. Borgov looks back. He doesn't nod his head. He just kind of looks at her and then look, looks forward. Um, and then they, they end up... So, before she plays him, she plays this other kid prodigy. And I actually just like this scene, because Beth is so fucking anime. She's just anime as fuck. She's playing this kid who's another prodigy. And little cute kid, kid, cute as a button. But as she's playing him, I guess she just knows that it's over. Like how you said earlier, where chess is over in four moves, but you might have to play for another two hours. She starts literally standing up and walking away from the fucking table as they're playing chess. And the kid is confused. And it's it's almost like in one way she's like throwing him off because he's... It is. It's part of the mind game too. Because she does the thing where like she's tapping her foot like she's yeah. she's impatient. She seems she's so like, impatient with his moves. She's like so aggravated by him. And it, I love this because I've done all types of weird mind game shit to my opponents before. So I get it. But it's just interesting because up until this point, she had just played people, beat them and walked away. But like for whatever reason, when she's playing this guy, she decides to employ some mind games. And I'm not sure if it was necessary, but I also think that she uses her like feminine laurels to kind of because he he's looking at her you can tell that he's attracted to her too like the little boy is very clearly like at that moment little billy knew he didn't want to play chess anymore like beth is hot i can't stress this enough but beth grew up hot okay the little girl who i was talking about who fucking had the really fucked up bow cut and just looked trash when she grows up and she's an adult she is fucking hot okay like she is hot so and i guess it's really i'm saying the actress is hot like and taylor joy i i i don't know what else she's in but whatever they did to her to make her look like this, I swear to God, there's a filter on this show. She just doesn't look real to me. She looks like she's partially CG. That's how good she looks to me. But uh, the little boy is clearly interested in not only beating her in chess, but also he's infatuated with the look of this girl. Just how she was when she played Towns the first time. Like You could tell that she liked it, even though she trounced him. She still looked at Towns like, damn, this guy's, this guy's pretty good looking. Uh, but she starts walking away. And it's this whole theatrical scene that she does. I love it. Like, she walks away, and she, like, looks around, and she's, like, kind of, like you said, tapping her feet. Then she'll come back. After he presses the clock, she'll walk back over, and within two seconds, make a move. She doesn't even have to, like, 
look at the board or think. She just walks over and immediately makes a move and then presses the button again and walks away again. It's very disrespectful to me though, because if somebody did that to me at Yu-Gi-Oh, I couldn't imagine somebody put their hand down, got it from the ta got it from the table, walked away. I make my play, they come back, and they just like play out their turn, and then they walk away again. Like that's what she's doing. It's very rude. Yep. And uh, at one point, she even sits down, but like away from him. Like a like I don't even know how this shit's allowed. It's honestly so disrespectful to me, but I love it. It's so wild, but it's like theatrical for the show's purpose, I guess. I don't know if this is something that happened in real life because you said this is kind of based on a real uh, person. I didn't know that. By yeah. The way. Yeah. Beth Harmon. Uh... Once again, I don't remember if they changed names. I don't think they did though. Beth Hart, like this show is based on a real person. There's a there's a book written about her. The Queen's Gambit is a book that was adapted into this Netflix show. But before the book, it was written and and inspired by uh, Beth Harmon's real life. Um, uh, now that said, obviously, just like anything that's adapted, like there are slight changes. Yeah, it's a dramatization. Yeah, there are slight changes, and things that are different. It's not it's not a documentary. Yes. Exactly. But it is very much based on the events of Beth's yeah. life. Because I don't even know. Maybe I missed it. I don't even know if this shit starts off like based on a true story or whatever. But anyways, uh, so she plays the boy. And I think it's what you said where she knew she won way before he realized that he lost. So she's forced to play out mm. the game. And they, they do. They get to a point and he concedes. And he's like, I just played the best player of my life. Like you are the best person I've ever played against. Like period. Um, so he, you know, he's blown away by her and he kisses her hand at one point, like very respectable little boy. And yeah, and I think he wishes her like good fortune or something. And, you know, she has to play board golf next. They they have a, a interesting thing in this in this instance where after the match, Beth sort of <laughs> a bit breaks the facade of like being rude or whatever and yeah. have a conversation. And because this kid, I think I do think part of it, part of the reason why she acted that way was maybe she was slightly annoyed because, like, this kid's touted as, like, a super prodigy. He's, like, supposed to become world champion by the time he's 16 or whatever. Yeah. And there's all of this stuff around him, and she ends up talking to him afterwards, and it, there's, like, an interesting look in the, not only his life, but her life, and, like, this pressure that gets put on them where she says, like, if you become champion at 16, like, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Like, what's next? And then, like, the kid doesn't even really know what to say about that. He's like, well, well I don't know what you mean. Like, what do you... He's confused by yeah. even the question, but it kind of is introspective to Beth in a way in that she's very young and trying to become world champion at a very a very young age, still older than this boy. Yeah. But it shows it I, I feel like it's a moment where it shows like almost like a slight response to her mom, where like there is more to chess in a way. Like Yes. It, it's just like an interesting aspect where I I feel like she's coming to the part in her life where she's thinking about more of her life than just chess and it's like she has to somewhat internalize like when she becomes champion like what is next for her in her life yeah i, lo I love that entire scene like i said it's very theatrical but even once you get past that like she beats him she's very respectful to him at the end and then he wishes like her fortune you know in her next match and everything like that with her future and commends her and then she goes on to play borg off and she gets scraped and when this she gets there the episode one starts actually right isn't uh, this where episode one start, starts? Isn't this part? No, because she loses to Borgolf twice before she beats him. So the first time she loses to him is at this tournament. But then the next time she loses to him, I'm pretty sure is in Paris. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay, that's where I thought we were. Okay. Well, yeah, so remember next time is when, like, she... Because when, when it starts, it starts off in the future. Like, the first scene is in the future, and she wakes up in a bed with someone, a mystery person, which ends up being Cleo, the girl. But they don't show you who it is that she's in a bed with. But that happens in Paris. That's a little later on. So we'll get to that, too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This okay. is I thought we were a little bit ahead of where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but she plays Borgoff the first time, and he just destroys her. And it's not. And she even says, he beat me with such unimaginable moves. As a way to say it was just basic. Kind of how when I played Peter Chang, and when he, was, when he was getting DQ'd, he kept saying, these are such basic moves. Like, these are such basic moves. Like, I'm not, I didn't do anything crazy. Like, these are such basic moves. So he just trounces her. And apparently he does it in such a way that's like, she's not, I won't say that she's not impressed, but she's kind of wondering like, well, damn, I lost to something that didn't even seem, she was, she expected to be wild. I just lost to just normal shit. I just lost the basic shit. Like this man showed up playing gadgets and beat the shit out of me 2-0 cream. And like, I, like, you know, losing the gadgets when you're a really good player, let's say, is not what you want for yourself. Like it's very, uh, 
humiliating. Let's just say that. Because that would be the most basic yeah, shit that you can lose basics. to. Yeah, I actually Back played the basics. Actually Fundamentals. Played, I actually played gadgets for the last Edison local I went to on Thursday, this past Thursday, and uh top four split. And I'm sure that people were losing to me playing gadgets. The only people the only person that beat me in Swiss was fucking McCabe, of course, because he ain't gonna let himself lose the fucking gadgets, but everybody else. I trounced everybody else with unimaginable moves. They were not very flashy. I'm glad you, gadgets don't do anything flashy. So, anyways, yeah, Beth, uh, she loses and she comes back to her room where her mom is in the bed. And this is what she realizes that her mom is dead. She's telling her mom about the loss and she looks back and her mom is just like frozen. And they say, like, hey, it could have been hepatitis. Like, we're not 100% sure. But she calls her adopted father who she hadn't seen in years at this point he never returned and she's like hey you know he he seems annoyed from the gate by the way he's so like what detached from this family he's like what do you want and she's like yo i just need to know where to bury her at like you know like what what do i do with the house like what where do i put her like we're in fucking bumble like we're not home like i have to fly her back that is such a scumbag dude oh it's awful like they're what in Mexico, right? So like they're in Mexico. So she has to like fly the body back. And then they, this is again, she's alone again. So it is back to that loneliness theme that keeps coming here. And they show at the end of the episode, after she has this conversation with her dad, he's like, Oh, you can keep the house. Like, fuck. Like, he wants nothing to do with Beth or his old yeah. wife. Yeah, he says just keep up the payments. Like, just keep the payments up. Yeah, like just keep you up the payments. Just so, like, him, like you can just don't care. Yeah, you just have it. Like he he does tell her, like, you can just keep it. Like, I don't care. Um, so he's like, as long as you make the payments, it's fine. Cause obviously that would fuck Ben on his credit. And that this is going to come up later. And I, you know, so Beth at, after she gets on the phone with her dad, after she gets off the phone with her dad, she goes down to a pharmacy, she finds a pharmacy and she requests some more of those tranquilizers, which she had been kind of like, not really on like that. But now she's like fully about that life. So at the end of the episode, oh, just like, yeah. Because she realizes, I don't remember how she realizes this, but in Mexico, you don't need a prescription to get them. Yep. To get these tra- to get these drugs in America, you need a prescription. But she, at the moment she's in Mexico, you you can just get them over the counter, yep. and she like loads up on them. She, she buys like I need a bunch, fucking ton of them, and that's the end of the episode. So you know what she's about to do. Uh, she flies back home. She has a drink on her way. The guy asks her if she wants a drink on the plane home. And at first she says no, and then she's like, actually, and she gets her mom's drink. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is like kind of cute. It's weird because it's like in one way, it's problematic in that like we know that she shouldn't be drinking. Like she's about to spiral. Another way, it is kind of cute. It's like she's yeah. getting a drink for her mom, and yeah, you know, yeah, no, and it's something that they shared together. They had she had her first drink with this woman. Um, and she loved this woman. It just sucks the way it ended. Like her mom didn't even really get to see her play that last tournament match like she was sick so she couldn't even be there for it like she's actually told her she was sick and everything so episode five and this is where it starts to kind of this is like the beginning of the end so beth has now officially taken a a real loss and she's back home and harry beltic shows up the first master that she played in that well he was the he was a state champion but the first guy that she played in her in her first one at the end he shows up and just like Towns, he's smitten by her. Like, he sees her. She's beautiful. She's hot. He can't believe it. He's like, oh, shit. Like, you grew up, but I'm not here. Like, he actually avoids the sexual tension. Because Beth is, not only has she spiraled, but she's just kind of getting into, like, this I don't care kind of mindset at this point. Like, she's in a very, I don't care what happens. Like, I'm just kind of doing what I want. She's been drinking. Uh, I think when he runs into her, she actually is taking out her trash and there's a fucking bin of bottles like a yeah. ton like she has there is her recycle bin is filled to the brim with alcohol and i think she like falls and shit like she she's just all over the place her neighbor sees her like dragging the uh dragging the alcohol and everything so she's she's a mess that is a fucking mess her mom just died she lost the tournament she has taken her first actual l she got destroyed by borgov it's gonna be printed everywhere right like it's bad everything's bad and harry beltic shows up he's like hey i'm here because I want you to review your games. And she's like, why would I do that? He's like, you don't review your games? Like, you don't... She's like, not really. Like, so Yeah, this, this is now like the second or third time they show us this, where like she... We know that she's a prodigy. We know that she's a genius. She's super good. But at this point, multiple top players have talked about reviewing her 
you're reviewing your games and she's like why would i do that like the game's over like i'm i'm past it i'm on to the next game yeah so this is once again another time where they're showing us this and it's like you know talent can only take you so far you gotta put the fucking yes, work it is, in. it's scary how far she's gotten with raw talent because basically beth has been playing they they find out in this episode like harry finds out that beth doesn't play like how other great players did where they studied a lot they studied the other pros she actually doesn't even like she read a lot of books and stuff like that but she doesn't replay the games like all the other pros did like they replay famous games to understand what happened mm-hmm. she never did that so she kind of just like read the books was like okay whatever like even when somebody brings up like did you read borgov's book she's like why would i do that like like well, you need to know your enemy like what the fuck so he comes and he has all this training material for her, all these books and as he's passing the books to her she's like i read this i read this one too and then he gets to a third book and he's like let me guess you read this one and she's like no but i have it upstairs so and she's like very short with him she's very kind of annoyed because harry is nowhere near her level never has been since she was a child she's only gotten better and he's aware of this he's not even trying to be like again he's just trying to fucking help but she's so got her fit her face up her own ass so bad that she can't even like see the fact that your friend is literally just trying to help you just took an l i'm just trying to give you ways to improve but she can't see that it's that ego it's like why would i take any advice from you you can't even beat me and Lo and behold, here I am. Like I'm the same. I was the same person. Like it's literally who I used to be. Why would I take advice from you? What have you topped? A lot. Like a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players have heard that line. We validated ourselves with our accomplishments. We feel like no one can tell us anything, especially if you're not someone. And I'm using someone with the quotes. It's like, who are you? Right? Like Harry Belton. Like the best you ever was a state champion. Like Big Whoop. And like I took that from you as a child. So she's very just not trying to hear what he has to say. Uh, but he's adamant about like, yo, I think that there's things that you could have done and they start to go back and forth. He's like, I spent a lot of time on this. Like I ain't it. And he actually does impress her a bit when he's helping her. They end up sleeping with each other. It happens randomly. And she says like, okay, like this is, this is a little bit better than, you know, what I normally would expect. She's like, is that what it's supposed to feel like? Uh, so she kind of likes him and he makes this comment about how he's going to move somewhere to be closer to his school he's going to be an engineer she's like you can move it with me which is wild but this just shows you how much she's not fully thinking and i also think that she's trying to escape the loneliness so i i agree with that a lot i think i think even more so than romantically i i I don't think yeah i think more so than her being interested romantic it's more so just like she as much as she's created this hard exterior and like in one like she is fine being alone yes. however everybody no matter what like you still want so like she's yeah. trying to stave off that loneliness yep i and i and like again i started this podcast off saying that i like being alone a lot but at the end of the day there are times when i certainly do want companionship whether that's with a romantic partner or with a friend like i can't be alone all yeah, the time and like time. her mom just died yes and like her mom just died, which was like her only, her only friend, her only partner yeah, in yeah, life to like be, to like talk friends. to and like be cool with. Yeah, not at all. And like the the few times she's tried to have friends, either like it was just like quote unquote mean girls that would make fun of her. Yeah, uh, that just didn't really understand her. I don't remember if this has happened yet in the episode that we're talking about, or if it happens maybe an episode later. But there's a part where like while she's spiraling, she ends up seeing a girl she went to school with, and like that girl already has a kid. Yep. And, like, a bunch of crazy shit's happening, but Beth is alone, and, like, sure, she's fine alone, but she still wants someone there with her. And so, it's, she wants him to stay stay and live with her just so that, like, there's someone else in the yeah, house. Yeah, you can you know tell I mean? it's not completely romantic, because, to be honest, I don't think she's that attracted to Harry Beltic, but it's, like, he's there. Yeah, there's even and a, I think whoever there's even it was. Where, yeah, there's even a part where he seems more interested in her romantically than than she is like yes i think it's after they're done having sex he's like really awkward and she's sitting there reading and he's like uh should i go back to my room and she's like mm, do whatever you want yeah like like she uh, she's such a strong woman i love her character because she's not really reliant on men in fact i would say that when she has sex with harry she fucks him like damn at the end well if you noticed at the end of their session she like gets off top of him. She like gets in a bed. She like lights a cigarette, starts smoking. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. he is just kind of like you said, he's like, should I go back 
to my room now or like what do i do and she's like whatever you want and she yep. doesn't it's like to her she used him for some dick and she don't really care what he does after that like if you want to stay stay if you want to go go i don't give a fuck you can do what you want uh i got what i needed from the situation i needed some dick my mom just died i just lost a tournament i'm smoking a cigarette cigarette after sex it's amazing that's just kind of the vibe that she's given off. Very like, I'm not trying to cuddle with you. I'm not trying to tell you all my problems. I'm not even about to cry to you about what happened to me. Like she didn't even really confide in him. And when I think about it now, they didn't show anything about her confiding in what happened. Like she just it's like, all right, like whatever. Nope. But he does. No, she like, just, I was going to say, she just deals with her problem in that, in like drinking and getting high and all that stuff. Yeah. And then she doesn't really confide in him. She just more so wants him around. Yes. So what, what you do get from this is he tells her that you're good, but you're going to need a lot more than your natural talent to be Borg off. And you can't, you can't just go into this off the way you've been playing everybody else off of just how the games evolve. She pretty much has been playing off of pure instinct and not planning out the game. She goes really, as the game unfolds, it's kind of how she like plays it. It's not like I'm yeah. trying to do this to you. I'm trying to do that. Beth has just been this entire time. So oh, this person made this move. This is the best counter move to that move if they make this move. Not really thinking ahead. And so that's why he's so adamant on her learning uh, specific pros and how they did certain things, all the different gambits that there are, because there's more than just the Queen's Gambit. There's like all these different types of plays that you can do. And she's like, oh, I hate this guy. Like They bring up this one pro from a while ago. And she's like, oh, I hate him. And she's like, yeah, I get that. You like, you don't like, like, you don't like his play style, but still, there's still something to be learned. And I think that's important too. Uh, aside from just being good and staying on top is like, okay, it's cool. You can top events. You can do well, but you can learn something from virtually anyone and you should never turn down the opportunity to learn. Like if someone, obviously if someone's speaking nonsense, like nonsense is nonsense and I get it. Some people are literally just spouting fucking nonsense as I call it. And I don't, I don't give them any leeway with me because I'm not wasting my time. But there are times when other people who have really good ideas or really good input, we tend to throw them to the side because we just look at them like, well, you're not even that good yourself. It's like just because someone isn't as good as you doesn't mean that they don't know what they're talking about. Some people who are speculators are some of the theoretical best players in the world. Like they're, they can't yeah, execute. Also, I was going to say also just because like someone is a different play style than you. Right, because like this person they're talking about is like an old school pro from like yeah. I, if I remember, it's like before she was born. Yeah, yeah. But she just doesn't like him and the way he plays. Yeah. And it's like, well, just because he's a quote unquote different play style doesn't mean you can't learn from it. I think you meant you brought this up a while ago, but it was one of those things where people in Yu Gi Oh or people in any video game or game, people put themselves in this box of play style, like oh, I'm a this player, I'm a that yeah. player, and it's like realistically you shouldn't be an anything player like there is a time and place to play certain ways yeah there's only one correct play at any given time there is no such thing as i'm a conservative player i'm an aggressive player that's the early Yu-Gi-Oh mindset too and probably the early mindset of a lot of other games but speaking from Yu-Gi-Oh, like back in the day especially go for my people were like oh i play really conservative it's like okay that's not a real thing but go off it's like people are like i play really aggressive like okay that's not a real thing either but go off like there is just Correct play, and that's it. Play styles don't actually exist. It's not a real thing. You can technically force yourself in a box and be quote unquote conservative, but you're just misplaying. Like if if the situation calls for you to set a monster, which is I guess conservative, then that's what you should do if that's the right play. But if that's the wrong play and you still set a monster because you're quote unquote a conservative player, you're just misplaying at that point. It's not you being conservative, you're just misplaying. Like that is simply a misplay. There's only one correct play at every given moment. Even if we don't see it, there is still only one correct play. And I think the thing I like about chess is that in chess, there's nothing hidden. There's no hand traps. There's no traps. There are traps, but not in the sense of Yu-Gi-Oh. Like everything is on the board from the very beginning. You can literally see every possible move that your opponent can make before they even make a move. Like everything is there. There's nothing hidden from you at all. So that's what's really cool about chess and what makes it really different from Yu-Gi-Oh in that way. But Yu-Gi-Oh, we're trying to do the same thing in a way. We're trying to build an information portfolio when we're playing. Like, we don't have all the answers in the beginning, but you can tell by the way your opponent plays. It kind of gives you reads on what they have, and then you kind of play around it if you can and stuff like that. Like, oh, I think you have Gores. I'll attack lowest to highest, but then I won't attack with my strongest monster. So I'll attack on everything but Stardust, and then I'll just stop. 
And so that way you never get to drop a Gores with a meaningful token, and that's like a really big deal. But again, it's like hidden from you, but if you're a good player, you like you think about these things. Beth had just been freestyling, which is so crazy that she made it all the way up to Borgoff by blatantly freestyling. And so Harry Beltic is trying to help her. And it gets to a point where they do a little fast forward, but they're playing chess and she's beating the shit out of him as usual. And she gets annoyed with him because of how bad he is to her. She's like, can't you see that, Harry? Like at, at one point she says, he's like, no, I can't actually. Like, I, I actually couldn't see it. She's like, he's like, I'm not as fast as you, Beth. And that's when he gets all depressed and mopey. And he's like, you know what? I'm moving out. Like he tells her like, yo, I'm leaving. He realizes I'm not in love with chess the way you are. I'm not in love with chess the way I thought I was. I'm not in mm -hmm. love with it in the way that a person has to be, the obsession that they have to be with it to win it all. In order to win it all, like to be on your level, Beth, I have to be obsessed with it in a way that I actually realized by living with you and like playing, I'm never going to be that. So living with her did teach him something too. It's like, yo, I'm, I know I'm not the best in the world. Like I know I'm nowhere near, but I also realized that I'm never going to be on this level. And he's tired of disappointing her because she genuinely gets annoyed with the fact that it takes him so long to see this, this like misplay. And uh, so he moves out, he leaves. And she's alone again. Here goes the loneliness again. Yeah, it's fucked up. And it, it is really interesting. It's like responsible. It, it's sad, right? Because in, in the case of Harry, it's like he has that big realization moment where he's like, you know, I this is something that I loved my whole life. And like, here I am really realizing. And part of him already kind of knew because yes. he's coming here to help her that like, I'm never going to be this. I'm, and like, you know, and he has to give it up. And it, I think he says something like, you know, I just got to go get, a, I got to go finish school or go get a real job or something like that. that. It's yeah. like, I got to just, essentially he comes to the realization where it's like, I have to just go be an adult now. Um, and yeah, he, even he says something just like that too. Even that aside, even if I stayed here, there's not really anything else I can do to help you. Like you far, like how you were saying earlier, Frazier, like you can still learn things from people that aren't as good as you, but Harry kind of comes to a point now where it's like, I, I am not good. Like, you've learned everything you can yeah, from me. I bought all the books and, like, to there's you. There's nothing else I we can do. We played through the games. We've done everything that we could do. You've definitely, like, she's improved, of course. And uh, he even says something about, like, I can't help you anymore. And she's like, You have helped me, though. Like, she does say it uh, before mm -hmm. he goes, Like, you have actually helped me. So it's not, it's not for naught. Like, he didn't do nothing while he was there. He actually did improve her. And he opened her mind up to, just more ways to look at the game, which was important because Beth was just such a closed off know-it-all. And that's just what happens when you have success mm -hmm. at an early age and no one to check you. You're just kind of like, oh, I've been getting this. I got this far on my own. Like, what do I need to study all this other bullshit for? Like, all I need to do is beat this one person in the world that I can't beat right now. It's pretty much how she feels. Yeah. So after she's <laughs> alone again, she goes to a shitty tournament and fucking Benny Watts is there, the cowboy. The guy she drew with in the U.S. Open, and he's talking about how sad it is that this is what it's come to. Like, look at where they're playing at. They're playing wooden pieces. Like, it's run down. It's all the competition's not fierce at all. It pretty much seems like in America, and compared to Russia, like chess isn't as big of a deal. So they don't get yeah, treated. Like I, yeah, I forget what the I forget what the name of this tournament is, but this is supposed to be like one of the biggest tournaments in the U.S. It might be the U.S. Open. It. It's kind of just like I think it's the U.S. Open. Gym it is. It's like a fucking auditorium. Yeah, like a school. Like it's auditorium. just like yeah. And in Russia, you know, it's it's a big deal. And yeah, he's just kind of like, dude, we're the best in the world. We're, we're the best in the U.S. And it's kind of just like, eh, whatever. Yeah. So they end up they end up uh, seeing each other in this tournament. Where it's, you know, really shitty, according to him. Like, the venue's bad. Like, why are we playing here? And that night, as she goes back to her room to study, uh, she starts hearing loud music. So she decides to just fucking go out. Because he didn't invite her out. Uh, but she rejects it at first. And then she's like, fuck it. You know, I can't study anyway. There's loud music playing. So she goes to the cafe. And he's there. And he kind of swindles her a bit. He's like, yo, Beth, let's play chess. She's like, no, I'm just going to get like a coffee or whatever. And then he's like, Oh, well my friend can get you the coffee. So he's like, Oh yeah, get a coffee. Give me yeah. apple juice. And like, you know, sit down, like sit down, let's play some speed chess. And she's like, sure. He's like $5 a game. And she agrees. 
and he beats her real quick. And there's a crowd developing. And she passes him a five. And was like, okay. He's like, again. And then they do it again. There's like a quick little montage. And she beats him again. And then you see her passing another five. And he's like, sets up the board again. Shuffles the deck again. And they do it again. And then he trounces her again. And then next thing you know, she's pulling out another five. Really irritated this time. There's a huge crowd around her. Passes another five. And he's like, again. <laughs> and it keeps doing it until it gets to a point where like, they just cut the scene and she's back in her dorm furious. Like she's up against the door, kind of like doing one of those things. She like slides down in anger, but she's pissed. Like Benny has pissed her the fuck off. He just beat her like six times in a row in speed chest. She couldn't win a game, took all the money she had. And he did it with that. You know, he's very pompous. Like his character is just naturally a pompous dickhead. So he, after she lost a Borg off, and then she goes right into getting destroyed by him. It's like, God damn, like, I'm not, I'm not winning against anybody at this point. And yeah, the story takes an interesting turn here. So the next day they end up playing in the finals of, I think it's the U S open. I want to say, but, uh, she wins. They play regular chess and she wins. She actually beats him. And he's pissed. He's not pissed. He's kind of like in a damn it. You are really that good. Like I beat you in speed chess, but it doesn't like speed chess isn't real kind of, and he does say this later on. Like, yeah, I beat you, but it was speed chess. You're not good at that. Um, but he loses the, he loses the tournament to her. And he says something like, like, fuck man, like you're actually just insane. But he's like, yo, I want to train you. Uh, I'm going to be going back to New York and I think that you could use it. Like, I think that you could use some training before you go to Moscow. Like you're not going to be able to beat the Russians without some training. He's like, the reason why I think between either Harry said this or, or he said it, but the reason why the Russians are the best is because they play as a team. Like to them, yeah. they're not individuals when they play. They're actually like, play, like Americans are very individualistic. We're a capitalist society. It's every man for himself. Be all you can be that type of thing. Like we're very, about each other and something, you know, sometimes we're about our own family, but it doesn't extend past that. Like some people are like, Oh yeah, my family and me, as long as we rise up, I'm happy. Fuck everybody else. And whereas in Russia in this show, they're like, yo, the Russians, the best players help the best players. Even if they're their competitors, they're still like, I want you to be better. Cause overall we're representing Russia, the country. So they want, like they want, yep to be better as a result of that. And America is not the same way. She won't even take advice from people normally. Like when, when he, when she first met um, Benny Watts, he told her like, yo, you misplay. He could have beat you. She wasn't trying to hear it. You know, she didn't want to take his advice or anything. So, you know, you get that sense of like, he is speaking truth to power and he wants to train her. So this whole, the, the second to last episode is a training arc. She goes to New York. He lives in a yeah. shitty rundown basement area. Uh, he bring he calls in a bunch of other people to play. They do a simultaneous, which is where you play multiple people at one time. It's really cool how they do that too. They, she did it when she was a little girl. She beat like her entire classroom. They set up every single student, and she just went around beating every single person in the room. So I like that they showed that again as an adult with actual pros though, and she's destroying them. Like Betty Watts and the other pros that she's with, she's just fucking destroying them in a simultaneous. She's just going down the line beating all of them. She meets this interesting French girl named Cleo. And you could tell there's some kind of energy there. Like there's definitely some, some curious energy. Let's just say it's a curious energy between those two. And, uh, at some point her and Benny Watts end up having sex. And after they end up having sex, he's talking to her about chess. She gets annoyed about it. She's like, is this seriously what you're talking about right now? And he's like, yeah, what the fuck? Like you came here to be trained. Like, yeah. Cause even before they come, he says like, when he invites her, he says, like, no sex. Yeah, he tells like, her. I, I truly do believe him in that. I don't think sex was really on his mind. Like, I, I do think he had, like, a goal. And then she comes, and, you know, they spend so much time together, they end up having sex. But I think what that scene really shows is that he is still really here to help her get better at chess. Like, yeah. he's not here to, like, make make her his, his yes. wife. And there's something else that happens, uh, too, and I, I guess I should bring this up. When Harry Beltic left Beth, he told her about her drug usage because she saw the pills in her cabinet. And he's like, just be careful, Beth. Like, he says that, but she knows exactly what he means. Yeah, yeah. he compares her to, like, uh, some other chess prodigy where yeah. that, like, was one of the best chess players in the world. And he retired by the time he was, I want to say, 22, he said. And she gets really mad. She's like, are you saying that, like, I'm going to end up like him? And I think he says, like, no, I'm saying you are him. 
Like you, you're addicted to drugs. You're an alcoholic. Like they, I, I want to say he says like he compared. He says they call him in the chess world like the pride and the sorrow of chess because he was so amazing, but his like light burned out so quickly due to his his drug use, his habits, his alcoholism, and he was saying like this is happening to you right now. Yeah, and uh, people see that and they try to help her. So when Harry Beltic left, he said to her like, "Be careful, Beth." Slow down. And then when she goes to train with Benny Watts, he tells her no alcohol. There's no alcohol here. And she's like, I didn't think there would be. But like low key, you know, she she wouldn't drink. Like she likes she likes her vices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she puts she's always stone faced about everything. But he tells her like there's no alcohol here, by the way. And she's like, okay, like I didn't ask for anything, but like, girl, you know you wanted to drink. So that that's pretty cool that there's two people now have been trying to get her to cut down on her vices because they want her to be a clear mind. When she does it simultaneous, she also tells Harry, like, I want to play for money. And he tells her, like, well, you're not good at speed chess. Like, she's like, no, I want to try it again, though. I don't know what kind of amps Beth got in this training arc or, like, before it. But somehow, now, like, her scaling, it, she's ridiculous now. Like, she's able to play speed chess and beat him and all the other pros. She takes all his money and she keeps doing the same thing. She gets her lick back. She goes again and she takes his money again and takes his money again. And he's like, no. Like after he takes all her money or after she takes all his money, you know, it gets to a point where he just, he's like, fuck that. Like, you're not running me out of all my cash and you're staying with me for free. Like, fuck that. Like, I, I got to call it into it. But she does take a lot of money from him and she keeps doing the same thing again. And so I like that she does get her lick back immediately. And uh, it shows that she's improved too. Like, she's just getting stronger and stronger. Like, she's just scaling higher. Like, she's getting closer to Borgov level. Um, but she still feels like she has to rely on her her pills at the very least. Like she still is under the belief that that's the only way that she can like reach her, her max. So that, that does come up a little later. Uh, there's a scene where she goes to a tournament and a reporter says something to her about like, if she's a little too glamorous to be a serious chess player. Yeah. 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 It's like a super once again, that, comment. Well, yeah. Once again, that fucking just that sixties energy where they're just like her being a girl and her dressing like whatever she, she way likes, she's dressing. So Beth likes to shop. That is a that is a, a thing I like. I relate to her on that. She Another likes one to, of her vices. <laughs> she, yeah, she likes to spend money. She likes to buy very nice things, uh, which I I respect. Like I like that. I like that. If you are successful in any kind of way, I'm all about treating yourself. I think that life is boring without spending your money on things that make you happy. I think that that's something that's always say in this podcast. Do what makes you happy. Like for me, buying nice things makes me fucking happy. And I don't think that it's, it's a good idea for anyone to work hard at anything and to not enjoy some of the fruits of their labor. So Beth shops for nice shoes and coats. She's always dressed super chic, super nice. And they, they try to paint her as like too glamorous to be a serious chess player, which is ridiculous. And she makes the comment, it's easier to play chess without the burden of an Adam's apple. She's like a little jab back at the reporter for like, you know, I... I actually have an easier time being a woman because that's essentially what you're saying is like, oh, I'm too glamorous. You're really just saying like, I'm a woman. How could I ever be a serious chess player? Like, what the fuck? Like, what's too glamorous to be a chess? What does that even mean? So she uh she hooks up with the the girl Cleo and they don't well okay they don't hook up at first like when she first meets her with Benny, but there's some energy there. She's like, yo, if you're ever in Paris, look me up. Like I might be there or whatever. So she goes to Paris, and yeah, she ends up. Cleo ends up finding her, calls her, is like, yo, you didn't even tell me you were here. Like, I found you or whatever. And she's like, oh, come down. She's like, I can't. I got to study. It's the biggest tournament for me. Um, she's like, well, you know, I'll be down here having the drink to you then. And then, of course, she goes downstairs, has a drink. They have a great time. Uh, they talk about. So this is this is a really good part of the show for me. Cleo talks about how most women would die for what you have. You have an actual talent. Most of us are just like women are not looked at as real people. It seems like at this time. So Beth being this person who like the newspaper writes about all the time and this really accomplished person, she's also an individual. She doesn't have a man like no Beth is not known to be attached to a man. She's known to literally be on her own. Like when they write about her, they're writing about her by herself. It's not like they talk about some great man training her or, 
taking her everywhere, her husband. They literally are forced to talk about how great she is on her own. And even though Beth hates it because oftentimes they just bring up how good she is for a woman, they are still talking about a woman in a high esteem. So when Cleo's talking to her, she's like, you know, you're beautiful and you have something that most of us die without ever getting to experience, which is a real talent. And it kind of makes her think about her mom, I think. Like her mom died without having ever got to fully explore her talent, which is the piano. So it just kind of makes her realize that whole there's more to life than chess. But also the fact that you have chess is beautiful in itself. Like you have something that most most women, I guess, didn't even get to experience. Like just the idea of an individual life like that. Like you get to try like you're in fucking Paris by yourself, living your own, paying for your own room, doing your own thing dressed beautifully, buying nice ass, like you're doing this all on your own, like everyone else is reliant on men. So it, it's a really cool, cool scene. I really like it. Like and then, she was, she was actually playing, like a lot of times, especially nowadays when people are really good at a game and they say like, I, I play professionally. It's like, well, you don't because you're not funding your life off of this. Exactly. Like she actually was playing professionally. That's only job was chess she is a real professional she actually lives off of only chess there is no other job she has and there's a whole debate in the Yu-Gi-Oh community about like what's a pro player and stuff like that and a lot of people are like well you can't be pro if you don't like earn enough money to literally play Yu-Gi-Oh as a professional like it's professional means you you do it as a career you're getting paid you support yourself off of it uh but you know, that's not here nor there. I don't I don't even entertain that debate. It's like whatever. Like the word maybe the word pro is the wrong word to use, but you I think what people need to realize is that when people are saying like a pro Yu-Gi-Oh player, they're not talking about literally someone who uh plays and supports themselves off of they're just saying like the best players, essentially, is what they're referring yeah, yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. But also you know, we've got things like sponsors and stuff nowadays yeah, that change. Exactly. Things. But even but, still, uh, even with sponsors in, is still in respect to what Beth's doing. She's literally just a saying that, she's like, the dictionary definition of a pro. She's like that fucking good. Like she's making the money, yeah. A lot of it too. Like Beth is paid. And Yeah, I mean, the clothes she has, like, like you, like, she's got real shit. Like she's buying expensive clothes. Yes. She's buying really nice stuff. And Cleo looks up to her. Like you can tell that she actually like idolizes her a bit. Like, damn, I wish I wish I could have that kind of life for myself. And they have a little thing. You know, this is where, like you said in the beginning, it starts off in the future. And she wakes up in bed with someone. And now you find out that that person was actually a woman. It was Cleo. And she's rushing because they're waking her up because she's late for the tournament. She's supposed to play Borgov and she's fucking late. This, this is like a callback to the whole Harry Beltic thing. She shows up. She's all frantic and she's also extremely dehydrated, which I can only assume means that she's a little hungover. Oh, I, she's more than a little hungover. She asks she for water constantly. Up. Like she's all, she's so not composed and it's kind of a. She's also shaking. Of, it's embarrassing, actually. I was going to say it's kind of embarrassing, but it's actually just fully embarrassing because Borgoff is looking at her. He's, like, raising eyebrows and shit. He's genuinely concerned. Like, what the fuck is going on with this American woman? Like, what is she doing? Mm -hmm. She's like, well, more water, please. And she's drinking the water in such a, uh, not a very sophisticated way. She's downing it. So, yeah, she's definitely hungover. She gets trounced by him, and it's sad. She goes back to, she goes back home. She goes back to Kentucky. Um, and her good for nothing dad is there. Like she gets there and the lawyers, a lawyer shows up. He's like, what the hell? And they're like, yo, uh, I want you out. I want the house. And she's like, what the fuck? Like you told me that I could have the house. He's like, no, I didn't. And she's like, that's a lie. You blatantly told me I could have the house as long as I made the payments. He's like, listen, I don't give a fuck about you. I don't care about that woman. I don't care about none of that. Uh, I don't care about the fact that we adopted you. Nothing that I did makes you entitled to my shit. He says it just like that, too. He's like, I don't care what I signed back in the day. That does not give you entitlement to anything that I, that is mine. So I want the house. And he's like, you know, that woman was fucking pathetic. And we, we tried. We tried one thing. It didn't work. And we tried another thing. It didn't work. And then we we adopted you as like a last hurrah to try to save it. But that didn't work either. And I told her I never wanted a kid. And it's just a whole it was a whole thing. So he spazzes the fuck out. And Beth is just sitting there like, oh, shit. And he called, like, again, he calls his ex-wife pathetic. And she's like, pathetic? I'm looking at pathetic. Like, you're fucking garbage. Mm -hmm. You're like, she was actually amazing. She was a beauty. Have you ever heard her play piano? And he's like, of course I have. She's like, no. Have you ever really fucking heard her play piano? She was brilliant. 
way better than anything that you've ever accomplished in your life. And so she gives him a lash. He's like, I don't give a fuck about none of that still. Uh, at the end of the day, I want the house. And she's like, I'll buy it from you. And he scoffs, like, how the fuck are you going to buy it from me? And she's like, how much? He's like, 7000 And she's like, your equity is five. And he's like, it's, it's going up since then, blah, blah, blah. She's like, fine. He's like, fine. She's like, yeah, fine. 7000 She writes a check, buys the house room. And I was like, that is a bad bitch right there. Like, I fucking love her for that. That entire scene where she just like, fuck you. Like, I'm not letting you have this house. Like, this house, me, me and my mom lived in. Like, she was a good woman. You come here calling her pathetic and all this other wild shit. And then, like, I, I offer to buy it. You're like, you don't have enough money to buy it. And she's like, how much? Like, what the fuck? Like, of course I have enough money. Like, who, who are you talking to right now? Like, do you know who I am? Very that energy. Like, big dick energy. And I love that. She buys it straight up. With, and for anybody that doesn't know, adjusted for inflation, I think 7000 is somewhere around 50000 today. Okay. So she just, like, yeah, adjusted for inflation. So she was just like... Yeah, 7K, sure. Like, she, boom. So, like, she's got bank. She just <laughs> casually buys the house on the spot. Uh, but he's a liar. And I didn't like that. She, you know, he blatantly lies. But she's like, you know what? Whatever. It's fine. I'll just buy the house. She buys it, and then she starts to renovate it. She rips down the wallpaper. Everything about it that's, like, old looking, she rips it down. She makes it look really modern. And apparently, she puts a lot of money into it. And, uh... yeah. I guess the, it does end up kind of biting her in the ass. It does end up biting her in the ass, yeah. She, so, because she's, like, back in Kentucky... And she even says to Cleo when they were in Paris, like, there's nothing that's really holding me down to Kentucky. Like, there's no reason that I can't just, like, live in Paris or live wherever I want. Uh, but then when she does get back to Kentucky and she has that whole fight with her dad and she buys the house, now she does have something holding her there, right? So it's kind of like, damn, you spoke too soon. As soon as you get back, you run into some bullshit and now you actually are there. But, uh, yeah, she fixes up the house and she goes on another one of her drinking binges. Like, she's off the deep end again. She just took another loss from Borgolf. And she's like, I think this is the scene where her neighbor sees her dragging out her garbage and she just has a ton, a ton of fucking alcohol in her recycling bin. And she enters a tournament. Harry Beltic's there. He tells her about her alcoholism. Like, th this is, again, another time of her just being told, like, yo, you're doing really bad. Also, there's this weird part right here where she has eyeshadow on or eye uh, eyeliner on. She looks fucking strange to me. Like, yeah, is, yeah. I don't think she looks good here. She she shows up to the school. I feel like that she first played that, like her very first tournament. It looks like that's where she's at, where she runs. Yeah, because she even sees the girl that she played. Yes, and the girl's like super excited to see her. But honestly, Beth is a little bit rude because she doesn't. One, she doesn't really remember the girl. She's like, "Oh, I, I played you." And she's like, "Yeah, we. I was your first ever match. I was there for two of your first. And she was like, "Oh, okay." Like she's just kind of short with the girl. But the girl is so happy to see her again she's like you know i love it you've been killing it like i see you've been doing your thing you inspired me uh you know I, i'm in med school and stuff like that like i'm you know basically being a nurse but uh i'm really excited to just see you again i actually came here i traveled here just to see you and beth mm -hmm. is super her skin is so pale she looks like she has jaundice or something like her skin is just she doesn't look good she doesn't look good at all. She has this weird, again, super weird eyeliner on it. I just, they kept showing it. I think they wanted us to notice it. Like, she's trying to be this badass, I guess. It, it, it's just not good. And besides her being short. I think, I, I want to say the, the eyeliner thing was, like, to show, to show just how deep she spiraled. Because yeah. she's drinking, she's high, she's drunk. And, like, she's going, she's just, like, going to sleep with her makeup on, waking up with her makeup on, like, yeah, she I, doesn't look good at all. The way I saw it, and maybe I'm maybe I saw it incorrectly, it didn't seem like it was intentionally designed that way. It was more so a byproduct of her not really taking care of herself. Yeah, she looks off. But yeah, he tells her about her alcoholism. She's off the deep end, and then at the end of the episode, she gets another knock on the door, and she's all pissed about it. And then she opens the door, and it's Jolene in adult form. So Jolene shows back up, her black friend from the orphanage. And I would go as far to say her sister, right? In a way, yes. Honestly, yes. Because they were really close as children uh, before she got shipped off. But yeah, Jolene shows up and she just catches her up on life. And this is the last episode. And this episode is really amazing. It's so crazy. To buy, by the way, this is the last episode. This was in the beginning of the podcast where I said, like, when I, I re-looked at the synopsis of the episodes, and I was like, holy shit. I was like, that's all one episode? Like, the episode Jolene comes back all the way to... Like, the fact that that's the last episode is crazy to me, because I feel like that's its own episode, but, like, it's not. Yeah, there's a lot, because there's a lot that happens in the finale. So the finale is Jolene comes back. Yes. 
Jolene catches her up on everything. She's like, yo, I realized that like, I want to be a paralegal. I want to be a lawyer basically. Um, so that's what I'm kind of doing now. At first I thought I was going to do something else, but I quit that shit. And she also lets her know that the janitor who first trained Beth died. So, you know, that's Mr. a like Scheibel. Yes. So that's a really sad moment for Beth. She's like, the funeral's coming up. We should go. So Jolene stays with Beth for a little while and they have a good time. Like they genuinely just catch up. They show them dancing together. Like she stays over for a while and they just catch up on life. Like, it's like you know, I've been following you this whole time. She goes to the funeral and uh, she finds out that Scheibel had been keeping a shrine basically of every accomplishment that Beth has ever had throughout her life after she left the orphanage. So he had been essentially rooting for her ever since the day she got adopted. And that shit was really heartfelt when she went into the basement and saw that like all of his, he had like, again, he had like all these little posters and all the little article clippings from the newspaper and pictures. And the picture that she took awkwardly when she was a kid with the one guy who also played chess that he brought in, she, she takes that picture off the wall. But it's like this whole heartfelt moment, you know, her going back to where it all began for her. And it's like this respect for him, too, right? Like, she really respects him. Like, he showed her the game. And obviously, he wasn't, you know, that great of a player or anything like that. But he still showed her the game. And, like, he showed her respect. Like, you, when you lose, this is how you respond. Don't call people cocksucker shit like that. You know, she was wild yeah. as a kid. She's wilding. He, she also, it's like a realization that, like, through all of this, like, there, re- there was still people. Because her sister... Um, yeah, Jolene comes and finds her and like they have this relationship with each other that's so much more organic it's not a competitive relationship like she has with basically everything else she's come across right. in her life she has like a real honest human relationship with Jolene similar to the relationship she had with her adoptive mother in that like it's just a human relationship um, and then with um, Scheibel like he really cared about her and this was another person that really kept her in his thoughts and was rooting for her and cared about her. And I feel like it's a moment. She has that emotional moment where she realizes like, there are people out there that really do care about me. And you know, I'm not alone. Like there's people, yeah. there's other people out here. And Jolene even says, Jolene even says like, Hey, he wasn't the only one that was rooting for you this whole time. Like, mm-hmm. cause uh, it gets to a point where Beth, like you said, she comes a little short on money after buying the house and she needs to get the Moscow to play against Borgoff and she doesn't have it. So, um, What's his name? Benny Watts suggests that she uses this Christian fund, this like group of fanatics, Christian fanatics that are trying to fight against communism. Is it? Uh, they're trying to fight against communism. Yeah, yeah. For Jesus, uh, and so they show up and they're like, "Yo, we will pay for your trip. We'll pay for everything." He tells her to run down. He's like, "They'll do everything. They'll send you with a person. They'll pay for that person as long as you stay in separate beds, because you know all about marriage and stuff. You can't have Benny and her in the same room. God forbid." And they're like, yeah, they'll do whatever you say. You just got to pretend that you're all about Jesus. And when they show up, Beth can't. One thing about Beth, she's going to say what she got to say. She doesn't agree with the nonsense they put in their little spiel. Like what she, they give her like this speech that she has to say. And she's like, I don't agree with this shit. It's they're like, why not? She's like, it's fucking crazy. She actually says that too. She's like, it's fucking crazy. And it, they're like, oh my God, like what the fuck? They're taking it. You know, I am never like taking it back. Like all yeah. holier, holier than thou. They want her to have like this whole stance, and she's just like, "I'm just a chess player." Yes. And and I, there's a part where they go, "But you're also a Christian," and she's like, eh, "Am she, I?" Like, she said, like, "Yeah, I don't know that I am." Like, what the fuck? So I like that Beth is still learning who she is in certain ways. Like, I don't even know if I believe in all. Like, like the, there's never been an inclination of religion with her. Her life has been really shit. Like, dad wasn't around. Mom committed suicide. Tried to kill me too. I survived, get sent to a shitty orphanage where they're drugging me, cut off my hair, made me look terrible. I'm gonna go back to that. And then, you know, like every my life just was not a very good one. Like as far as the early stages of it. So maybe she doesn't have the biggest faith in all that. And and her adopted mom wasn't all about Jesus either. So normally that's where kids pick it up from, right? Like religion is usually imparted by parental figures. But her mom adopted and the people in the orphanage didn't really impart that on her. So she doesn't really have that. She's like, I don't know if I really am what you're trying to put on me. So she rejects it. And they're like, we already spent so much money. She's like, I'll pay it back. How much? Yeah. She gets out her checkbook. And Beth is just like such an honorable fucking person. She, she could have just been like, y'all burnt. Like period. Like y'all, y'all, like whatever I beat y'all for y'all are burnt. I'm not paying it back. It is what it is. I'll find my own way to Moscow. But she's like, no, I'll pay it back. Like how much was it? So she pays them back. 
And he, Benny gets on the phone. He's like, you're fucking crazy. Like, no, I know that they said you were crazy before, but like, you are actually crazy for what you just did. What are you going to do now? And she's like, well, maybe you can help me. And he's like, no. She's like, oh, come on, Benny, you have money. He's like, even if I did, I'm not helping you. Like, what the fuck? Like, I'm not doing that. And so he like hard nose, like I'm not helping, period. I gave you what you could have done. You fucked that up. Now you got to find another way. He hangs up. And then that's when Jolene tells her, like, you know, you, Shiba wasn't the only one rooting for you. She forks over the money, which is, like, actually pretty insane. Uh, Jolene helps her out, makes sure that she can get to Moscow. And, and she, she, gets- she she makes it clear, like, like, I'm rooting for you. Like, I think you can win. Like, you're going to win. You'll be able to pay me back. And then she's like, Beth says something like, what if I don't win? She's like, well, you got a lot of nice dresses. Like, yeah. she's like. Jolene's like, I'll sell your fucking dress. Yeah, like we will figure something out. <laughs> but you... it's like a real, like, it's yes. real, like, good relationship. Like, yeah, we'll yeah, figure yeah. it out. Like, go ahead. I got like, you. Yeah, I don't mind lending you this because I know at the end, at the end of the day, you can pay me back. Like, I'm not. You know what I mean? Like, we're young. Like, they're not very old, right? Like, at least you know, jo- Jolene's not old either. But she was always older than Beth. But Beth is still young, twenties probably at this point, um, maybe twenty years old. So she's still pretty young. It's like, okay, you'll be fine. And so, yeah, she goes to Moscow. She runs into towns. She beats all her opponents. The one opponent that I really liked was the guy with the really big hair. I thought he was just really cool. Uh, yeah, the guy that looks like Albert Einstein. I love that he guy. He looks broken as fuck. Like, if this was a real anime, that guy would be... You could tell he was broken because their game went so long that they had to seal their move. And that's, like, a cool thing I like mm-hmm. about chess is that when the game has to go into an intermission until the next day, they like make you make your next move, but it's like sealed in an envelope. And then the next day, the tournament organizer kind of walks up. They make the move for you, and then they start the clock. So yep. she has to seal her move. And that night, because she's in the same hotel as the Russians. So that night, as she's like walking down the hallway, she sees the door open with Borgov, her opponent that she just the, the guy with the big hair, her opponent is in there with Borgoff, even though they are in the same tournament competing against each other, theoretically, right? Like you're in the same bracket. We're going to play each other at some point. Borgov is helping this guy to beat her. It's exactly what Benny warned her about and told her like the Russians help each other. They're a team. So despite the fact that Borgov wants to win, he's still spending the entire night helping her or helping the guy to beat her because she's an American. So she walks up and she's like, wow, like this is the real deal. And she kind of runs away before they can see her, but Borgov notices somebody might have been watching he closes the door. It's a really unique scene or whatever. And then they go to her room, and she now she has a fire under her ass. Because before that, she was just kind of doing the same thing that she normally does, which is drifting, I want to call it. She's just like, whatever, like, I'm just, I just win. Like, these people, nobody can beat her but Borgov, let's be clear. So even though she's playing against this guy, he's pretty difficult. She's still pretty comfortable, and you could tell about her energy. Like, she doesn't think that she has any chance of losing. But she sees Towns, and she gets interviewed by all these people. She speaks about how great Scheibel was. Like, they say, who who trained you or whatever? Like, who taught you how to play chess? She's like a really great man named Scheibel. And they, uh, she and she said, make sure you print that, too. Because, you know, they have a history of just yeah, yeah. not printing what she says and stuff. So she gives props to him, which I really liked. Uh, she runs into towns again. He apologizes for what happened in uh, Mexico or whatever. And still, I just think this guy's gay. But uh, yeah, so they get together. And now she's all serious about beating the big hair guy and winning the tournament. So she runs to her room after spotting Borgov helping her opponent. And she pulls out the game. She pulls out the chess game. And she's all like trying to make sure she uh, she puts the, the board together the exact way it was before they had to make their last move. And it's really cool because she's doing something that she normally doesn't really do. But also she gets a phone call from Benny and he's like, hey, it's a different time over here. Like we're like six hours behind, I believe it is, because they're in America, they're in Russia. So it's probably behind. So she's like, you guys are in a different time zone, but I invited all the pros here. We're all here and we all want to help you. And we've been working on it for a long ass time. And they come up with all of these plans and all these different variations of ways to play to beat him. So now you have the same thing happening with Borgov and the Russians is happening with the Americans and Beth. And so she's super excited. She's like, get a pen, write this down. And Towns is helping her. He's like helping her find a pen and parcel and everything like that. And uh, yeah, she's taking down notes. She's studying the whole night. And they're like, Beth, good luck. You can do this. You got this. 
And yeah, the next day, she finishes her match with big haired guy, Albert Einstein. And he gives her the highest commendation. He's like, I've just played the best game of chess in my life against the best player in the world. Like, period. And he's like, you are a marvel. Thank you. And he kisses her hand. It's so, oh, I love, I love it. Guy. I fucking, I'm That's telling so you, cool. if it was an anime, because he's also, you have to imagine, he's ridiculous. Like, he's one of the best players in the world. He was considered I, one of the I top. I think they players. mentioned he was, the, he, he was the former world champion. Okay, like, yeah, before think, Borgoff, he was the world champion. Yeah, I think he was, like, that guy. Like, he's broken. You can tell he's broken. The way he speaks, though, is, oh, man, the accent, just the hair. Like, he's such a cool character. Like, I, wish he, I wish it was an anime. They didn't make this shit into an anime. He's so cool. But yeah, he's broken, and yeah, so she she beats him. He congratulates to gives her this really high commendation, and her next opponent is Borgov. And they play, and of course their game goes super long. They have to see you know seal the move and all that shit again. Um, but while they're playing, like in the finale, she starts staring at the ceiling because there's a point where she doesn't believe that she can do it without her drugs. Like she she believes that she needs her tranks. She's like, I can't see the game. I, that's the way I visualize. She tells Towns, like, that's the only way I can visualize the game. I need it. And they tell, like, yo, you don't actually need that shit. And when she's playing against Borgov in the finale, it's really cool because she unlocks the ability to visualize the game in base. Like, she doesn't need the amp from the pills anymore. Like, base Beth can just literally do her, like, visualization thing. That that skill where she looks up at the ceiling and sees the pieces move really rapidly. She starts doing that during Borgov, and he literally starts staring up at the ceiling, as as well as all the reporters all of the people observing the game, they all start literally looking up because, like, she's looking up. Like, what the fuck is happening? So Borgov's, like, looking up. What the fuck is she looking at? Yeah, but now in base form, without any kind of amps, she's literally doing her visualization visualization thing, which looks really cool when you see it. It's like, the chess pieces are all shadow misty, and they're moving real rapid. Then they go back, they reset to base, and then they go back, and they start moving again. I love it. I love, I love the fact that she unlocked that ability in base, and now she's just, like, she stares at him, and she gets like this really intense stare and she just starts playing again and she's playing with such a confidence. And then it gets to a point where he's like draw and they comment immediately. They're like, holy shit. Borgolf has never in his career offered the draw. And she thinks about it for a second and she goes, no. And she like shakes her head. They finish the game out and he beats her and he stands up and he tells her like, you are fucking insane. Like that was beautiful. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. He said, what a, uh, I don't know if it was him with a big hair guy, but one of them says, what a beautiful recovery. Like, something mm. like that. And, yeah, so she beats Borgoff it's, finally. It's really cool to see that. It, it's really cool the way they um, show Russians in this show. And what I mean by that is, and a lot of American media especially, Russians are always shown as almost being cartoonishly evil. Yes. And it's cool to see, like, they're just normal, regular people. Like, they're just regular people. And they, they have a lot of honor, and they take the loss with, like... They take the loss with grace. They're yes. not, like, kicking the fucking so chair So what's funny shit. you say that is that the show does poke a jab at the way media tries to portray Russians, especially back in the Cold War era, right? Like, in this time, <laughs> with the whole Red Soviet and all that stuff. Uh, if you remember, she has to be chaperoned everywhere she goes while she's in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. she's considered, yeah. like, an asset of the United States. And the guy says... Don't go anywhere without me. I mean, literally, you can't go a single place without me. Also, if you notice them make any kind of signals, anything at all, let me know. She's like, what the fuck? What kind of signals? And he's like, I don't know. I don't play chess. But if you notice something, you let me know. And she's just looking like, what the actual fuck is going on? Like, what are you on about? She looks genuinely confused at when he says that on a plane. He's like, if you notice any signals, you let me know immediately. She's like, what kind of signals? Like, she's confused. Like, what the fuck? And he's like, I don't know. I don't play chess. But if he makes any kind of weird signal, you tell me immediately. <laughs> so there is still that. But she, the show kind of points, it, it kind of makes a comedy uh, out of that whole situation. Like, it, it pokes fun at yeah, that. Yeah. How ridiculous. Because he sounded ridiculous, right? And even Beth thought, you yeah. sound ridiculous. So I'm glad you brought that up. Because I almost forgot about that whole, the whole chaperone thing. And every day that she beats an opponent while she was out in Moscow, at first it starts off with like her having like maybe three or four fans the first day. Every opponent, yep. she the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when she beats the guy with the really big hair, the Einstein looking guy, uh, the crowd is like humongous. Like she has this insane crowd to Dude, the point I, where I love they show how everybody 
because you know not TV isn't common at this point in time. Right. So everybody's like gathered in like let's just say a plaza and they're listening to it on a radio. And, and then by the time it gets, I think, by... to the last game for Borgolf, they fucking have it on the radio. There's a reporter, and then the the, the they have like a big chessboard, yes, and they're like doing the move so yeah, so that people can essentially watch it. It's fucking crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. I really like the ending of the show. She finally gets her lick back on Borgolf, so she beats him. She becomes world champion, I guess, is that how that works. And, uh, yeah, I mean, she's learned the game to a point where I assume they might go back and forth. I don't know if she just has his number forever. They don't show us. They just show us her beating him once. But it is really cool because it seems like once she learns, it's, like, impossible to beat her. And on top of that, like, her being world champion, that's that's an amazing thing. That's the highest of the high. It's, like, the best thing that she could ever accomplish. Uh, now she's trying to figure out what she wants to do with her life afterwards. and. Before she goes back home, she instead decides to just walk around Russia for a bit. And she comes across a plaza where there's a bunch of men just playing chess in a park. And she's just admiring the fact that they love it so much there. So I think that she kind of sees, like, maybe this is my new home. Like, she, you know, she falls in love with that. Something I really appreciate about that scene, how it ends, is she wins, you know, this tournament. And everybody that's not her is, is viewing this as if it's America versus rush yes and she's just viewing it as like i'm playing chess against Borgov. so if i remember correctly she after winning is like going to go meet the president like they're like oh you got to go meet the president and then when she ends up getting out of the car and she goes like to just hang out with like the quote-unquote normal people in the yeah. park to just play chess like with the it's like a really nice scene she's like i don't care but like i just yeah everyone's like, this is what i love like i don't care about going to play chess and all this other they're shit. trying to I mean, politicize I don't, her I don't care about going to meet the president yeah yeah everyone was trying she's to like this is what her. i love and okay, go ahead yeah th- yeah this is this is what she loves it's really cool the, the ending is actually amazing it's it's one of the reasons why the show is in my top 10 of all time is because start to finish i think there there are no bad episodes i even like episode one like there's no bad episodes in this yeah entire. yeah same. And it's a miniseries, so it's like short and concise. It doesn't need a season two. It has that perfect little ribbon on it. Like, it just wraps up beautifully. You know how annoyed I would be if they were like, if they announced a season two? Because, like, the show is successful, right? Thank God there's not a season two. I don't even know. This is where Netflix could get really bad. Like, what the fuck would happen in season two? Like, what would even have Borgos? I don't revenge? know. Squid Game doesn't need a season two, it all right? It did not need a season two. <laughs> Like, Queen's Gambit, I don't even know, because she's the best player in the world now. Like, she's the fucking absolute best. And she's hot. She grew up hot. I keep saying that, because that's, that's the line from The Wolf of Wall Street. She grew up hot. It's the scene where Leonardo DiCaprio is talking to her. Uh, what's his name? I forget the, the, the fat guy's name, but uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is talking to him in a cafe, and there's this one part where he says, like, there's this rumor about you marrying your cousin or some shit. And he's like, yeah, no, I mean, you know, her, her father is the brother of my mom. <laughs> and I was like, that is the most roundabout way to fucking say somebody is your first fucking cousin, by, just by the way, that you married. But he's like, yeah, she, she grew up hot. Yeah, she grew up hot. Like, she grew up hot. And all these guys were trying to fuck her, so I wasn't going to let some other guy fuck her. I was, you know, if anybody's going to fuck my cousin, it, it's, it's going to be me. It's, you know, like it, it's going to be me. So, yeah, she, I mean, she grew up hot. So I keep, I keep saying that line, she grew up hot, because it just, it reminds me of the Wolf of Wall Street. That shit's hilarious. But uh, yeah, this show was amazing. 10 out of 10. I don't think it has a flaw. I don't even look up, like I know people look up uh, 10 things wrong with this, 10 things wrong with the Dark Knight, 10 things wrong with Infinity War. I don't do that. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to try to ruin this for myself. I'm not going to look for any plot holes. I don't even look up if Towns is actually gay. I, I Actually, I do care. I'll probably look that up after. But actually, I do care. I do. I just... I think he's gay. I think, I think Towns is gay, gay too. I, I don't let think it's us a hot know, take. I don't think it's a hot take. Let us know if you think that Towns is gay, is that what they were trying to insinuate with the the guy that came in the room that was somewhat flamboyant and just looked like a twink? Like I just feel like I just feel like Towns might be a switch hitter. You know what I mean? Like I just I feel like you know I don't know. I think, <laughs> but either way, I like that this isn't a romantic show either. This honestly, all of the romantic like romantic scenes that she's had were not really romantic like every time she had sex it was awful yeah. pretty much that you know she has sex with benny watts even though he kind of at like he didn't really want to but she's so fucking hot and hard to resist it's like god damn it like at some point yeah yeah you got i'd her. argue 
I'd argue, like, all of this, like, there wasn't a single romantic sex scene. No, like, it wasn't. All none of the was sex there. scenes were romantic. The only romance was her crush on she Pounds. Crush on, was, yeah. like, the only romance, so to speak. Yeah, because at one point... They, that doesn't go anywhere, and the show doesn't dwell on it. They do ask her, is there someone that you, you know, that you like? And she does, she does say Towns. Um, but, again, they never do anything about that. Like, it, it kind of just doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And when he sees her in Moscow, he's a successful journalist now. Like, he actually works for that the Herald or whatever it's called. So he's, like, actually in the career he said he wanted to go for. Because he used to be a chess player, too. But, again, he's just like Harry Beltic. He's not anywhere near as passionate about it and as obsessed with it as you need to be to win it all, as they say. I love that quote, by the way. Because I, I you know, I relate to that. Like, you give up a, a huge part of yourself to try to go for it all. So, yeah, I mean, the show, it's just... It's just the bee's knees. For me. It's just so, so good. Uh, I, there's so much I can say about it, but I think I did give a lot of comparisons to the way I feel about it as far as from somebody who competed at a high level in something and who, like, you know, really went off the deep end at times. Like, I didn't have any problems with drug and o- drugs and alcohol, but I had problems with ego for sure. And just, you know, that, that what that does to you is just, it's, it's really bad as well. And, uh, and, you know, the crazy thing is, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community, there is actually a lot of people who have abused drugs and things like that. Like, Beth relied on her tranquilizers or whatever the fuck, those pills, because she thought that that's the only way she could do well. And there's a lot of the quote-unquote pro Yu-Gi-Oh! players who have relied on Adderall to do well at events, especially, like, the older ones. Like, a lot of them, every event that they've topped pretty much has been under Adderall, and they feel like they can't even play at a YCS without Adderall. And, like... I didn't find this out for a very long time into my Yu-Gi-Oh career. Like, honestly, I had already won a YCS and it had been like a couple of years before I realized that like these motherfuckers were popping. I mean, once you start sharing hotels with people and they just start talking candidly, it's like, oh God, it's like, yeah, like people just feel like they need Adderall and I never needed this. So I'm like, you guys, some of them had one more than me. You know, I guess that limits the list that take that cuts the list down quite a bit. So you guys can probably narrow down some of the people I'm talking about, but like, you know, they've used Adder- like Adderall as a crutch. I don't think that you need it to top a Yu-Gi-Oh of it. Like, I just think it's ridiculous to me. That's what's sad. What's sad about it is that a lot of people that get stuck in that spiral and end up becoming addicted to drugs or addicted to that, they actually don't, just like the main character of the show, Beth, they, they don't need the drugs, but they they mentally become reliant on it. And it's not really their fault. Like, they become addicted to it. And they got to... You know, you have to now fight through that and get sober, so to speak. But um, Everyone's these people about, are great. So like nobody no Adderall, and I'm like, I am fine I, as I am. And I just don't think it works that way. Like, I, there's people that trick themselves into thinking that way, and it becomes this unfortunate thing because you don't need drugs to be good. Like, no, none of those. Nobody takes Adderall and then wins. Like, Adderall is not magic. Yeah. Drugs aren't met. Like, you're not going to win because you took drugs. Like. If if Frazier starts taking Adderall tomorrow, he's not going to just win the next YCS. Like it's just not how it works. And unfortunately, because a lot of the best players ever have you know taken Adderall and been successful with it, it has spread throughout the community that that is that's a thing. Like that's a correlation. Like Adderall equals success. Honestly, so you know I I, I hate that that's a thing, but I know that it comes from a place of. Uh, being results oriented, it's like, oh, I was on Adderall when I won, or I was on Adderall when I topped. And if a person gets their first top, God forbid, with Adderall, you can just fucking chalk it because yeah, they're going to yeah. believe that that is the sole reason why they did well, and they will never give that shit up. So, but just watch it with that type of shit, guys. Like, I mean, if you're, you know, it's hard to get through to somebody who, if you really believe that that's the only way you're going to do well, it's hard to get through to you. But if you're somehow listening to this about like drug use and Yu Gi Oh, it's just to me, it's just not one. It's not that serious to me. Personally, you know, you might be able to like easy for you to say, but like, I just don't think it's that serious. Um, I think that you're brilliant without it. If you have the propensity or the ability to do well on Adderall, I certainly think that you could do it without it. I, I just don't think that it's necessary. But Beth found that out at the in the last episode. She found out, you know, when she really wanted her pills and she didn't get them and she unlocked her real ability and base. Like, yeah, you don't need it. You don't fucking need it. All right, so before we get out of here, as I always do, let me give a shout out to our patrons. There are 35 of you, so bear with me. Uh, Let me make this shit a little bigger, too. All right, so going down a list from the first to the newest, we have Connie, Austin, Leon, Quest, Garen, Xavier, Hylian, TCG Automotive, Silver Chronic, Tyree, Dimitri, Alexander, Vinny, 
Giovanni Avelos, Game for Yoshi, Alex Flamer, Game Marini, Henri Reynolds, CJ, Dub K Dad One, Saw at Dabbers Gaming Cafe, Dan Vrabel, Dennis Milburn, Joseph Marcello, Scott Page, Red Vines, First to Home, Adelis Fernares, Tom Watabiki, S. Akuma, Mitchell Niles, Athor, Midwest Gaming, uh, Bill Shapiro, and Dimitri Dimsum. Thank you guys so much for being on our Patreon. If you guys don't know, we drop exclusive episodes on the Patreon. In fact, the episode for April was already recorded, so that should be being uploaded yep. soon, uh, if not already. Uh, and then we will also be doing another exclusive episode in May that is only on the Patreon. And the people in the Discord uh, get to vote on those episodes. So if that's something that you're interested in. We also have discussions about all types of random shit, memes, rants, things that are going on in their culture, things that are going on outside of their culture. We talk about everything in the Discord. So... If you're interested in that type of thing, check out the I'm Nerd Podcast Patreon to gain access to the Discord. It's for our patrons only. But once you're in it, you're in it forever. It's, you're in it for life. Okay? So it's not like if you join a Patreon and you're only on it for one month and you decide, you know what? I need the extra money. It's fine. Like, I, whatever the case may be, if you cancel, it's fine. We, we don't police it and, like, kick people out of the Discord once they, if they ever do stop supporting it, it's fine. Um, but, yeah, if you want access to that type of thing, you know, check it out. I'm Nerd Podcast on Patreon and yeah we also have a youtube channel check that out and yeah give us a like subscribe on apple Podcasts, spotify wherever you listen to the podcast we really appreciate all that stuff that goes a long way helps with the algorithm i've been told so and as i always say do the things that make you happy unless you believe that taking adderall makes you a better Yu-Gi-Oh player in which case no i can't there's nothing there's nothing i can add to that it was beautiful and poignant (laughs) okay good night